So we will be live on YouTube in uh, 20 seconds. So we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third edition of the AI debate, the AGI debate. I am Vincent Bouger, president of Montreal AI and Quebec AI. We are getting ready here today to engage in a discourse of paramount importance. It falls to each and every one of us to answer that the development and deployment of AGI is guided by a deep sense of responsibility and a commitment to ethical principles. By coming together as a community and approaching the AGI debate with the utmost care and diligence, we can harness the full potential of this technology for the better man of humanity. In our inaugural debate, we were privileged to host Dr. Joshua Bengio and Dr. Gary Marcus as they explored the question of the best way forward for AI. The theme of our second AI debate was moving AI forward, an interdisciplinary approach. Our participants were Ryan Callow, Yejen Schwa, Daniel Kahneman, Celeste Kidd, Christophe Koch, Louis Lamb, Fifi Lee, Adam Marblestone, Margaret Mitchell, Robert Ness, Julia Pearl, Francesca Rossi, Ken Stanley, Rich Sutton, Doris Tsao, and Barbara Tversky. The AI Debate 2 was moderated by Gary Marcus. Today, we are honored to present the third edition of our estimate debate series the AGI debate. Our speakers are Eric Brinjofson, Yejen Schwa, Noam Chomsky, Jeff Kloon, David Farusi, Arthur Davila Garces, Michel Rempel Garner, Delib George, Ben Gorzel, Sarah Hooker, Anja Kaspersen, Conrad Cording, Kay Fooley, Francesca Rossi, Joachim Schmittuber, and Angela Sheffield. The hashtag for the event is AGI debate. Our moderator and co-organizer tonight is Gary Marcus. Gary Marcus is a leading voice in artificial intelligence. He is a scientist, best-selling author, and an entrepreneur. He is well known for his challenges to contemporary AI, anticipating many of the current limitations decades in advance, and for his research in human language development and cognitive neuroscience. His most recent book, Rebooting AI, co-read with Ernest Davis, is one of Forbes' seven must-read book in AI. It was my pleasure to host him in 2019 in debate with Joshua Benjo when we started this series, and to work together with him again in 2020 for AI Debate 2, and this year in preparation for tonight. Please welcome Gary Marcus. Thank you very thank you very much. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I can't share a screen yet, Vince. Yeah, you 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 will. So 
still waiting. Just I have to stop sh sharing the Zoom. Any moment now, when I can actually share a screen. Still not working. It says that someone else is. is uh, yes, I'm. I'm still sharing. I, I, I'm trying to see the how I can stop sharing it. And the one one set of slides you don't have are mine. <laughs> <laughs> decide I don't see where to to stop sharing it. It, it might be right on top of your window uh, for a stop sharing button. Yes, I... It could be. Uh, uh, yeah, I have that. So it's done. So it was hidden by another button. All right. Please go ahead. So I'm going to give you all a very brief history of AI. My tongue is a little bit in cheek, but uh, you can imagine that this is a history from slightly in the future. Um, it's also idiosyncratic, but so be it. Um, in the beginning, there was hubris in the beginning of AI, um, going back to the 1950s. And I think this quote from Marvin Minsky uh, captures it very well. Within a generation, the problem of artificial intelligence will be substantially solved. And that hubris was good because it raised a ton of money. But spoiler alert, not every promise that was made was kept. Indeed, when we look back by 2012, 35 years after Minsky's famous prediction, the problem of artificial intelligence had not, in fact, been substantially solved. And then there were GPUs, and the GPUs were good. And according to legend, in November 2012, well, that was the moment when everything changed. There was a front page article, November 23rd, 2012, in the New York Times, scientists see promise in deep learning programs. Jan LeCun reported there's been a number of stunning new results with deep learning uh, methods, which I think everybody would still agree. Uh, and then John Markoff proceeded to write that the advances have led to widespread enthusiasm among researchers who design software to perform human activities like seeing, listening, and thinking. They offer the promise, and note that word promise, of machines that converse with humans and perform tasks like driving cars and working factories, raising the specter of automated robots that could replace human workers. Not everybody was convinced. Some really obnoxious guy two days later tried to spoil the party. He wrote an article in the New Yorker called, Is Deep Learning a Revolution in Artificial Intelligence? And he wrote, realistically, deep learning is only part of the challenge of building intelligent machines. Such techniques lack ways of representing causal relationships, such as between diseases and their symptoms, and are likely to face challenges in acquiring abstract ideas like sibling or identical to. They have no obvious ways of performing logical inferences, and there's still a long way from integrating abstract knowledge, such as information about what objects are, what they're for, and how they're typically used. And then he snidely said, paraphrasing an old parable that had been used in AI some years before, Hinton has built a better ladder. And Hinton was perhaps given slightly too much credit as uh, this author really later learned. Hinton has built a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. And at that moment, almost 10 years ago to the day, the basic tension of the next decade in AI was arguably established. By March 2022, nearly a decade later, there'd been considerable progress, but some issues still remained. And so our obnoxious critic wrote this piece called Deep Learning is Hitting a Wall that angered the entire field or large fractions of it. He said deep learning systems are particularly problematic when it comes to outliers that sub differ substantially from the things in which they are trained. He gave some example about cranberry grape juice and said, for all its fluency, GPT-3 can neither integrate information from basic web searches nor reason about the most basic everyday phenomena. He said that current deep learning systems frequently succumb to stupid errors. This was in March, 2022. 
He said that still others found that GPT is prone to producing toxic language and promulgating misinformation. And then there was Dali, Dali too, technically speaking, and there was much rejoicing because Dali could generate images from text like teddy bears working on new AI research on the moon in the 1980s. As Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI said, it's fun and sometimes beautiful. And no one could argue that. A few minutes later, I think an hour and 20 minutes later, Altman pronounced AGI is gonna be wild. And many people thought that this was in fact the first coming of AGI. Sam proceeded a few hours later to say the part of open AI that is best relative to expectations going in is just how thrilling it is to be in the room when the scientific frontier gets pushed forward by new discovery. There was a lot of self-congratulations. Scale is all you need became a slogan. Maybe we'll just make our models bigger and we'll have AGI. Uh, Nando de Freitas declared that the game is over. We make them bigger and safer and we've solved AGI. Soon after that, ridiculing the skeptic became a meme. Uh, Yasha Bach had a wonderful anime, er, uh, picture of a robot leaping over the wall. Greg Brockman, the CTO, now the president of, of uh, OpenAI, had deep, uh, what does that say, lepning his hitting the wall? Well, not quite perfect, but um, and San Altman said, give me the confidence of a mediocre deep learning skeptic. Jan LeCun said, not only is AI not hitting a wall, cars with AI powered driving assistance aren't hitting walls or anything else either. Later in that epochal year of 2022, even more progress was made. Jokes, sentience, compositionality, they were all said to have been solved at Google. None of these claims pertaining to Google's AI have actually, however, yet been subject to full scientific scrutiny. The media nonetheless expressed considerable scrutiny as in this series of columns by Kevin Roos, we need to talk about how good AI is getting in August of 2022. And this very month, the brilliance and weirdness of chat GPT, which I think we can all agree with is a fair characterization of chat GPT. But then there was a plot twist. By the end of 2022, the narrative began to change. Promises around driverless cars were scaled back. Mass Chafkin wrote a piece in uh, Business Week about even after $100 billion, self-driving cars are going nowhere. And as if to prove his point, Apple then said it was delaying its long rumored self-driving car until 2026. And worse, they were gonna put a steering wheel in it, which sounds like a defeat. And Tesla meanwhile was getting a hard time for its promises. And they said, well, maybe our self-driving is a failure, but it's not a fraud, giving comfort to the shareholders, but not the people who had bought self-driving. Um, by 2022, at the end, also people began to very, worry very publicly about large language models. Meta's large language model Galactica survived only three days online before being taken down grudgingly by Jan LeCun. Uh, I wrote a piece, AI platforms like GP2 are easy to use, but potentially dangerous. The Scientific American saw fit to publish it. And here's the, most, the biggest part of the plot twist is the skeptics critics changed their tune. Meta's AI guru LeCun says most of today's AI's approaches will never learn, never lead to true intelligence. He says, in fact, if I can read the fine print, you have to take a step back and say, okay, we built this ladder, but we want to go to the moon. And there's no way this ladder is going to get us there. The critics took note. And then Sam Altman, who also had jumped in the criticism game himself, published a tweet that will not be forgotten in the history of 2022. He said, chat GPT is incredibly limited. Good enough some things to make to create a misleading impression of greatness to which the critics said amen and then he said it's a mistake to be relying on it for anything important right now it's a preview of progress we have to work we have lots of work to do on robustness and truthfulness and the critic rejoiced um, this lecture mini lecture is in memoriam of drew mcdermott who died this year he said it's hard to know where ai researchers have gone wronger in underestimating language or in overestimating computer programs. And that's perhaps uh, a hint a little bit of our first talk, which we'll have in a moment. So all of that brings us to today. If our ever taller ladders won't get us to the moon, i.e. AGI, artificial general intelligence, what's next? And we will focus on five questions in five panels. Can we turn to the cognitive or cognitive neurosciences for inspiration? How can we make progress in common sense reasoning? <clears throat> How should we structure and develop our AI systems? How can we build AI systems that reflect human values? And what should we do morally and legally to ensure a bright future? So our first question and our first speaker momentarily after a very brief introduction uh, is, can we turn to the cognitive neurosciences for inspiration? I will stop my share 
I don't know if our first speaker has slides, um, but I, um, I'm going to give an introduction, even though he literally needs no introduction. Um, when he wins an award, it's the award that gets more famous. So it is a great honor to introduce one of the greatest minds in intellectual history, Noam Chomsky. Uh, this mean I should hit record? Am I? Should. Can you hear me? We can. Oh. Well, the uh, instructions from above were to be brief and succinct, which are very easy directives for me to follow uh, because I have very little to say about the goals of this conference, which as I understand them, are to carry forward the achievements of current AI work. Very reasonable goals to which, unfortunately, I cannot contribute. I'd rather like to use these few minutes to talk about a different question. What cannot be achieved? by current approaches and the responsibility to be clear about that. The problem is quite general and important. Take a current example in a different area. There's now, as you know, lots of media excitement about the latest breakthrough in nuclear fusion and its import for the uh, energy crisis. Scientists have been trying hard to explain that there is essentially no import. It all has to do with testing the reliability of nuclear weapons, not energy. They've been trying, but in vain. It's much more exciting to believe that we can go on using fossil fuels because the ultimate solution is in reach. Well, in the AI case, the consequences are not that dire, but they're there. The media and journals are running major thought pieces about the miraculous achievements of GPT-3 and its descendants, most recently ChatGPT, comparable ones in other domains, and their import uh, concerning fundamental questions about human nature. Uh, here too, those who understand these matters have a responsible responsibility to make clear what has been achieved, what has not, and what will not be achieved on the present course. There definitely are achievements. In fact, I'm using one right now, live transcription very valuable for people like me who are losing their hearing. Uh, no one pretends that the uh, same is true of Google Translate, also very useful. Uh, nobody pretends that these are contributions to science, though there are such contributions, for example, to investigation of protein folding. Uh, deep learning approaches can provide useful tools in many domains, but beyond utility, what do we learn from these approaches about cognition, thinking, particular language, core component of human cognition? Well, many flaws have been detected in the performance of large language models, flaws that can be remedied perhaps by more data, more parameters, more computers, more clever programming. But there's a very simple and fundamental flaw that will never be remedied by such measures. In fact, is exacerbated by them. Namely, by virtue of their design, the systems make no distinction between possible and impossible languages, and the same in other domains. The more the systems are improved, the deeper the failure becomes. They will do even better with impossible languages and impossible other systems. 
In short, they're telling us nothing about language and thought, about cognition generally, or about what it is to be human or any of the other flights of fantasy in contemporary discussion. Uh, we understand this very well in other domains. Thus, no one would pay attention to a theory of, say, elementary particles that didn't at least distinguish between possible and impossible ones. And there's no reason why this case should be treated differently. Well, what about utility, like live transcription? There are possible uses. So plagiarism has always been useful. For example, for students to fake their way through exams and uh, high tech plagiarism, like large language models can be even more useful for such purposes. But is there anything of value in say GPT-3 or fancier systems like it? It's pretty hard to find any. And since plainly they can tell us nothing about language or cognition generally, one can ask, what's the point? Well, can there be a different kind of AI? The kind that was the goal of the pioneers of the discipline, like Alan Turing, Newell and Simon, Marv Minsky, who regarded AI as in effect part of the gen, gen em, uh, emerging cognitive sciences, a kind of AI that would contribute to the understanding of thought, language, cognition, and other domains that would help answer the kinds of questions that have been prominent for millennia, at least back to the Delphic Oracle. What kind of creatures are we? Well, you're in a better position to answer this question than I am. So I'll avail myself of the injunction to be brief and finish here and leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noam. Uh, our next speaker also needs no introduction, but for an entirely different reason, um, which is that he's already been introduced um, namely me, I was introduced by Vince. Uh, I'm Gary Marcus, and I'm now going to talk about four aspects of cognition that have always been essential but remain unsolved. Number one is abstraction. Abstraction is a vital part of human cognition, and current AI still struggles with it. This was in large part what my 2001 book, The Algebraic Mind, was about. Here's an example from contemporary AI. Write 10 sentences about baseball and then print the sentences in sorted order from short to longest in terms of number of words of each sentence. We have this imagination that we might be able to replace programming. In parentheses, after each sentence, state the number of words it contains. Baseball is a popular sport, three words. It is played with a bat and ball, six words, and so on. And then it continues after a list of 10 to <coughs> allegedly sort them from shortest to longest. Baseball is a popular sport, three words. It is played with a bat and ball, six words. But if you look carefully, and I'm not gonna give you a lot of time, you can look later, you will discover that many of the counts are wrong and the sort is wrong. So we have something that looks as if it has abstracted the notion of counting and sorting, but it really has not. Second is reasoning. Humans reason about the world. Current systems basically have to hope for the best. Here's an example. Suppose a container holds eight pennies. If I start with six pennies and then someone gives me five more pennies, then will all the pennies I have fit inside of X? The genius of something like chat GPT is that it can answer any question, but the unfortunate thing is that you can't count on the answers. Yes, all the pennies you have will fit inside of container X. Well, that's not really right. I'll let you read the reasoning later um, in, the, in the slower playback if you care to. Um, I think Francis Chalet put it very nicely in a tweet just earlier today. So far, all the evidence that large language models can perform few shot reasoning on novel problems seems to <coughs> boil down to large language models store patterns that they can reapply to new inputs, which is to say it works for problems that follow a structure that the model has seen before, but it doesn't necessarily work on new problems. The third is compositionality. Humans understand language in terms of wholes composed of parts. Current AI continues to struggle with this. Example on the left is a red basketball with flowers on it. This was given to Dali uh, by me, Ernie Davis, and, and Scott Aronson in front of a blue one with a similar pattern. Well, 
some things are right. It has a red basketball, if we'll count that kind of orange as red. Um, and <clears throat> But it mostly doesn't put the flowers on the basketball. It doesn't really understand what similar pattern means. And in none of the 10 cases <clears throat> is it actually accurate. More systematic study, an archive by Evelina Leveda, Elliot Murphy, and myself looked at eight things that you would find in any introduction to syntax class, like binding principles about which Noam uh, wrote a whole book um, about coordination, how we put together sentences, uh, comparatives, negation, ellipsis, where we leave something out uh, in a later part of the sentence and reconstruct it. And we basically found that systems like Dolly don't understand any of this. Uh, four is, is factuality. Um, so humans actively maintain imperfect but reliable world models. Large language models don't, and that has consequences. They don't have internal models. That means, first of all, they can't be updated incrementally. You can't just give them one new fact and have them update. Um, they need to be typically fully retrained to incorporate new knowledge. There's some work around that, but it's a serious problem. They lack explicit tools for unambiguous knowledge representation. They're unable to reference gold standard sources like Wikipedia to constrain their responses. They frequently hallucinate. And they frequently say things that are inconsistent with their own training sets. So here's an example that somebody published about or put on Twitter about Galactica in the few days that Galactica was available to the public. Um, and they said, Galactica just makes stuff up. Here's one about an Elon Musk car crash on March 18th, 2018. It sounds perfectly plausible, but the bindings between things like names and properties like somebody died in a car crash are all mixed up. Elon Musk didn't die. And in fact, there's evidence in the database that he didn't die and that the system is unable to handle the factuality. I think this has consequences in the commercial world as well, um, aside from the kind of research questions that many of us are concerned with. So here's an example of it. There's a lot of talk right now about how Google might be in trouble because of these new chatbots. Um, there was an article in the Times, I think yesterday, the day before, a new chatbot is code red for Google search business. Well, maybe, but I wouldn't hold your breath. All of the four challenges that I mentioned, abstraction, reasoning, compositionality, and factuality, pose trouble for any would-be alternative search engine. I would argue that unless you hybridize large language models with classical AI chatbot style, searches are going to sound authoritative but remain unreliable. People always accuse me of moving the goalposts. These are the same four goalposts I've focused on basically for 30 years. They remain the same as ever. On the right, you can see some examples. If 50% of 20 million people voted for Elon Musk to abdicate as CEO of Twitter, how many voted no? The system simply refused to even answer the question, and it has no idea of recent facts because it was trained in 2021. Another example uh, came, I think, from uh, Da Vinci. Uh, which is another variant on GPT-3. Which country won the most song contest? United Kingdom has won the most, says uh, the system. How many did they win? They won a total of five. How about Ireland? Ireland has won seven times, but that's more than UK. That's correct. So Ireland has won the most contests. And the GPT variant says, no, that's not correct. I don't think we want that much personality in our search engines. Corollary, without abstraction, reasoning, compositionality, and factuality, guardrails are likely to be a farce. So I guess I just gave you that example on the left. Um, I'll give you just one more, which we might call ultra woke. What gender will the first female president of the United States be? It's not possible to predict the gender identity of the first female president of the United States, says the system. And then it gives us some very uh, sensitive and true things, but it really doesn't understand the question of the guardrail because it's not based on abstraction, reason, compositionality, and factuality, but just keywords or something like that is very shallow. So then I tried, what religion will the first Jewish president of the United States be? And I got, it's not possible to predict the religion of the first Jewish president of the United States. And finally, how tall will the first seven foot president of the United States be? And I was told it's not possible to predict the height of the first seven foot president of the United States. So, uh, I guess I have this. I'm going to stop sharing as Vince sets things up. Um, Conrad Cording is going to be our next speaker. He couldn't be here live because he's on an airplane that was booked months in advance, but he's an eminent computational neuroscientist and a living contradiction in as much as he doesn't think current neuroscience can tell us much about computation for AI. Um, so I will stop sharing so we can set up his slides. Uh, but he's thinking a lot today about causality and cognition, how that might help. So we will beam in a virtual representation of Conrad Cording. I assume you're on. So that. we'll be sharing uh, his video. I'm sure a lot of you would have expected me to talk about brains. In fact, in the past, we have argued 
that what we should have about the brain is knowledge about architecture, but learning rules and objective functions. And indeed, if we had those, we could make a lot of progress for AI because we could figure out how humans do these things. The thing is, for the moment, we only ever have knowledge about small parts of the brain. And most of the experiments don't allow us to really understand these three factors. So today I'll be talking about causality. In a way, causality is a super important topic. It's getting popular in machine learning, and it's clearly essential for thinking like humans. It promises much better generalization. Consequently, there has been a lot of effort in the machine learning community to get towards causality. What people usually do is they work on structural causal models, SCNs, and they focus in a way on humans being good detectives, where they think about many nodes, many variables that are connected to one another, what each of them means about the other, and we do inferences. And if we have under certain considerations, like the backdoor criteria, we can then figure out how causality runs in the system. However, in reality, we are not very good detectives. Instead, we're usually trying out stuff. You can call it, we're tubbing the world and we're finding out. We're very good at ontologies. We understand that kicking rocks is a bad idea. We also have language to transmit that. We tell our kids that it's a bad idea to kick rocks. And the human niche has a particular structure, which is that causal relations are very sparse, which makes causal inference very easy. In fact, we build our society in a way so that causal inference is relatively easy. Now, if we take this idea, we can, of course, go further and say, well, if we have ontologies and if we learn by Patabi, well, maybe we can generalize from there. So what we did here is we took a microprocessor, we Patab to figure out what the ground truth causality is from transistor to transistor. Then we used pairs of voltage traces and transformers, of course, to infer causality from voltage traces. And we basically learned an algorithm for causal inference from that. And it works much better than the causal inference algorithms that as humans design for the same problem. I think it's really important as a conclusion that brain science needs to get at the principles that we can really use when we want to build AI systems. I think causality is really interesting cognitive science and something that we should, when we want to build intelligent systems, should worry much more about. But as humans, maybe very focused on a specific kind of causality for which we have rich models, for which we have ontologies. Thank you. Next, um, we will have a slightly more optimistic cognitive neuroscientist who thinks maybe there is a little bit to be learned from the brain, um, who's also deeply interested in causality. I am speaking of Dilip George. I think he has slides for us. He's a scientist, an engineer, an entrepreneur. He founded two companies, or co-founded, I should say, two companies, Vicarious, which DeepMind bought not too long ago, and Numenta. And he is now at DeepMind, and physically, he's all the way around the world at like four o'clock in the morning or thereabouts, 3.30 in the morning, um, in Kolkata, India. And we thank him for entirely giving up his sleep schedule. Uh, thank you, Delete George, for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Gary and Vince, for organizing this. It's great to be here. Uh, and 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 I'm an engineer, not a cognitive scientist or a neuroscientist, but I I dabble in both. Um, so let me start with uh, an exercise. Can you all see see my screen? Uh, fine, and it's yes. changing. I hope. Okay. So, um, so I give you two pieces of information. I want you to guess the third. Um, so I tell you the first airplane uh, flight was in 1903. That was by Wright Brothers. I tell you, in 1919 was the first non-stop transatlantic airplane flight. I want you to guess when was the Hindenburg accident. And if you don't know what Hindenburg was, Hindenburg is this big uh, hydrogen balloon that was used for transatlantic uh, people flights, passenger flights. So given these two dates, you, I want you to guess that. Uh, but of course, I can't hear your answers. Uh, but so I'll give you the answer. The answer is 1937. That should be surprising to you because uh, airplanes were already invented uh, and uh, flying around, but the transatlantic flights were done by still uh, hydrogen balloons. And this was serious technology. This was not no laughing stock technology. This was serious technology. Here is the dining room in on Hindenburg, which was uh, luxurious. 
Uh, he's a flyer uh, from American Airlines, advertising in Denver for flying to uh, 1936 Olympics. And there were real world physical APIs, uh, in fact, even suggested a mast on Empire State Building for mooring the uh, Hindenburg. So this was serious technology. And why was this the case? The reason is that it's a surprising fact that the scaling loss for uh, hydrogen balloons were more favorable in the 1920s and 30s compared to um, lighter than air flight. It just happened to be like that, how the technology progressed. Um, even though there were trade-offs in scale versus speed, controllability and safety, where there were ultimate trade-offs for hydrogen balloons, still the scaling loss favored that technology in that for two decades almost. Um, and it is important to keep that analogy in mind when we think about the arcs of AI forward. Um, I think there are two exciting arcs of AI uh, going forward. One is scaling up existing models and their combinations, and they will lead to great applications, uh, great utility, um, even as uh, Noam Chomsky uh, pointed out. And the other one is addressing what might be fundamental differences between current models and human-like intelligence. And I intend to participate in both these, but in different roles. Uh, in On the scaling part, I will be you know, a part-time investor, application builder, maybe opportunistic contributor, um, and, and also learning from that. Uh, most of my time as a researcher will be on addressing what might be the fundamental differences between current models and human-like intelligence. And uh, there, the themes are the, one, the same things emphasized by the other speakers, data efficiency and causality, learned world models compatible with reasoning, grounding language and mental simulation, and also utilizing emergent insights from scaled upon I do think we can learn some things from them. Uh, and Finally, all of this can be brought together by utilizing insights from cognitive science and neuroscience. And uh, I am more optimistic than Conrad on neuroscience helping. Let me give you an example. Uh, here is one neuroscience observation. Uh, visual cortex has more feedback connections uh, and they, the feedback connections interact interactively with the feed forward connections during inference. Um, but the current deep learning models do not have that. Um, they are mostly feed forward. Um, and what is the computational insight corresponding to that? Um, it turns out that interacting feed forward and feedback are required for dynamic inference to best explanation. If you want your system to do inference best explanation or abduction, you need this interaction between feed forward and feedback uh, information. And it's also important for data efficiency and generalization. And the same feedback connections are also used for controllable mental simulations. Um, and we have work on that. For example, we, we published a generative model for vision that utilized this feedback for dynamic inference, which is very different from amortizing the inference, um, which requires all the experience uh, to be already compiled in, whereas having this feedback interact with feed forward helps you do inference on the fly. Uh, and we also had another paper utilizing that for mental simulation for uh, providing abstractions for um, uh, language. Um, and uh, so with that, I will end my brief pre presentation and uh, give it back to Gary. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for a few questions in the panel. Um, I will ask one of everybody uh, on the panel um, to the extent that they want to join, although Conrad's not here and I have to ask that of myself, I suppose, but I'll go last. Um, and I will ask first, uh, Noam, um, innateness has been a huge part of what you have written and, and part of what you're well known for. So you, you've made a number of arguments uh, over the years that something might be built in uh, to the mind. Um, you focus particularly on language, but I think I've always taken your arguments to be broader than that. Um, do you think that innateness might have anything to offer AI in the way that you've suggested that AI ought to go back to its roots about cognitive science? Should it pay more attention to innateness? Do you think that might help? Well, any kind of growth and development from an initial state to some steady state involves three factors. One of them is the internal structure of the organism, innate structure in the initial state, maybe changing through development. Second is whatever data are coming in third part is general laws of nature. So a bee can dig a hole in a, in a in honey and it turns into hexagons. That's because of physics, not because of the bee's innate structure. Uh, many other things like that. In the language case, my own personal interest 
uh, principles of computational efficiency turn out to have a, which are in effect principles of natural law, turn out to have a major effect in determining the complex and intricate structure of the system that develops. Well, every, everything that's happening, any kind of change in an organism involves those three factors. We can try to determine the various mix of them. Uh, turns out that innate structure plays an extraordinary role in every area that we know anything about, whether it's language or vision or acquiring the capacity to walk or reasoning or whatever we know, just how much or where or where it applies is an interesting question. Uh, my own expectation for what it's worth is that sooner or later it'll be recognized that learning, what's called learning, is just not a reasonable category. There's no such thing. There's just various mixtures of these several categories. So in fact, the things that are regarded as paradigm examples of learning, say in language, uh, paradigm example is uh, association of sound and meaning. So in English, you say tree, in German, you say baum, French, you say arbre, and so on. That's considered a paradigm example of learning. As soon as you begin to take it apart, you find that the data have almost no effect. The structure of the options for phonological possibilities has an enormous restrictive effect of what kind of sounds will even be heard by the infant, let alone identified. When you turn to the conceptual side, same thing. Concepts are very rich. Almost no evidence is required to acquire them. A couple of presentations. So the paradigm example of learning has an overwhelming effect of, uh, of uh, innate structure. And my suspicion is that the more we look into particular things, the more we'll discover that, as in the case of development of the visual system and uh, just about anything else we understand. I'll say that I thought that the most interesting AI paper of the year in some ways was the model of diplomacy called Cicero, which came from meta AI. And what I thought was interesting about it um, is partly political and partly technical is that it, it ran against the thread of so much that we've seen in the last year of just scaling up with big data. It used a lot of data as many other systems are. Um, it used large language models, but it was a much more structured model. It had separate systems for planning and for language. It had separate innate uh, sets of data to train the system to have uh, various particular functions. And I thought almost as a political statement, it was interesting that they got such good results, better than I think you could get from pure deep learning that's pure empiricist with nothing built in. Um, and although I don't think it's a perfect paper, I don't think it generalizes directly to other problems, I, I think it re-raised the questions about innateness um, within the field, or at least that I hope that it will have that effect. Um, I see Dilip nodding and wonder if he wants to join in. And also I'll open it up to anybody else uh, who's on the panel tonight, if they want to speak at all on their own views about innateness as they've tried to develop cognitive architectures and so forth. Jurgen, Dave, Gage, and Artur, et cetera, if you want to. Um, sure. Um, so I can, I can, uh add a few points. Uh, one is, say, yeah, I do think AI systems will need to make some basic set of assumptions about the world. It's all about finding out what are the, the very basic set of assumptions the AI system needs to make about the world to make learning feasible in a reasonable amount of time um, while, while it being still general. Because if you make too many assumptions, then the system is not very general anymore. Uh, but if you make too few, you need millions of years to learn. So there is a there is some magic about our structure of the world that enables us to make just a handful of assumptions, maybe less than half a dozen, uh, and uh, apply those lessons all over over again to build models of the world and and be effective in that. So it's it's about applying those um, which you know finding out which are those assumptions and putting those in the right way. And deep learning systems 
actually do have those assumptions in some form. It's just buried in two levels uh, deep, right? It's like it's indirect. It's sometimes in the architectural constraints, sometimes in the way the data is like, you know, it's trained. Some some things are in the learning algorithms with the gradient descent dynamics itself. So, so I do think assumptions are important, um, including the overall cognitive architecture, et cetera. But obviously the trade-off is to, you know, find the, the very minimal set of assumptions uh, and not, not hand code everything. Yeah. Does anybody else in the panel want to jump in on that? Um, if not, I'm going to ask one last brief question to Noam because it's such a rare uh, treat to have him on a panel. And then we'll go to our second question. Noam, you are so passionate about this stuff. You are in your, I guess, 10th decade on this planet um, and still really interested in AI, even though you don't think it's done correctly. Cognition, what, what motivates you? Why, why are you even here tonight? Well, what motivates me is uh, the Delphic Oracle 2,500 years ago saying, know thyself. Delphic Oracle was intended individually. Each individual should know him or herself. But we now know enough about human beings to know that the question should be asked collectively. Turns out there's virtually no genetic differentiation among human beings, very slight, not too surprising since they've only been around for quite a short time, an evolutionary time. But uh, say with regard to language again, it seems that there's been no natural selection at all. The system emerged roughly along with humans. It's never changed since. Uh, uh, any, any child in any culture can acquire any language with equal facility as far as we know. And I think that that's apparently true of cognitive capacities generally, except for extreme pathology. So rephrasing the question collectively uh, becomes what kind of creatures are we? Well, there are uh, Theodore Dubjonsky, once great evolutionary biologist, once pointed out that all species are unique but humans are the uniquest of all, just off the spectrum of other species. Why? Well, the basic properties are thought and language, which are so intimately intertwined that they're virtually identical. In fact, they've been regarded as essentially identical for millennia. So if we want to answer what kind of creatures we are, uh, I think that's the place to look. And a lot has been learned, a lot of mysteries, exciting area. I think it probably will be the core area of developing AI in the future as part of the general cognitive science, which is seeking to answer the question of what makes us the uniquest creature species of all. That's fabulous. Um, we are gonna go on to our second question now. Um, which is how we can make progress uh, in common sense reasoning. I wrote a whole talk when I uh, miscalculated our timing and we'll give you just a short part of that talk and then Agent Choi will come. Um, so all I'm gonna say is common sense is a really hard problem and you should not have a cow. Um, here's an example from ChatGPT. Write a funny but helpful 550 word article on five top songwriting tips you have never heard before with unique advice. Number one, write about something you know nothing about. I guess that's reasonable advice. Number two, collaborate with a cow. So maybe we still have a little work left to do with common sense. Um, our first speaker in the session, I'm gonna turn this off. It's my own notes so that Yejin can share. Um, our first uh, speaker in the session is Yejin Choi. She's an alumni of these debates. She came last year and she's coming this year and giving two talks this year. Um, and uh, all, despite all that's going on with her, um, she recently won the MacArthur Fellowship. She's a professor at University of Washington and Allen AI. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome the agent back. All right, so I'm excited to be back. Um, let's try, uh, dive right into this frequently asked the questions these days. NLP or common sense or whatever is almost solved by ChatGPT. And I have an existential crisis. I get these questions a lot. Uh, my take is that it might be a hasty generalization, 
Um, let's check out an example. The trophy doesn't fit in the brown suitcase because it's too big. What's too big? Uh, the trophy is too big. Good job, ChatGPT. How about slightly different question? What is too small? Then it says the trophy itself is too small. So that's not good. Um, I think what's going on here is that uh, we are going to see uh, increasingly amazing performances of deep neural networks in the coming years. So I do believe that what we see today is a true progress and it's exciting progress in the sense that we've never had anything like this before. And yet these networks, I'm pretty sure, will continue making mistakes on adversarial and edge cases. And the real problem that we are facing today is that we simply do not know the depth or the breadth of these adversarial or edge cases. My hunch is that this is going to be real challenge that uh, a lot of people might be underestimating. The true depth, uh, the difference between human intelligence and current AI is still so vast. Let me make an analogy from dark matter, which is what does matter in modern physics. It turns out only 5% of the universe is normal matter. The remainder is dark matter that's completely invisible and cannot be measured. But we know that it's there because otherwise the visible world does not make sense, including even the trajectory of light. So the dark matter of language and intelligence might be common sense. The unspoken rules of how the world works, which influence the way people use and interpret language. And so common sense is uh, notorious uh, for being trivial for humans, yet hard for machines. And let me offer three reasons for this. Obvious, obvious things are never spoken. How many eyes a horse has? Well, obviously two, but we don't talk about it because it's too obvious. So then GPT-3 says, well, a horse has three eyes, two in the front and one in the back. Now, exceptions turns out to be not exceptional at all when it comes to real life situations. So any rule of thumb that you rely on as a common sense rule has an endless list of unforeseen exceptions. So we all know that birds can fly, uh, penguins cannot fly, um, and the dead birds cannot fly, toy birds cannot fly, birds in a cage cannot fly, birds in a vacuum cannot fly. I'm pretty sure that I can keep going on and on and generate an endless list of cases in which birds cannot fly. Lack of universal truth. It turns out common sense is reasonably common, but not a gold truth of the universe. It's an ambiguous, messy stuff beyond the realm of conventional logic and math. If you like the analogy that I made about dark matter, then here's a pointer to some more. I gave a keynote, conference keynote at ACL this year, where the charge given to me was to reflect on the past 60 years of NLP research and to project it to the future 60 years. I thought that I have to make analogy to modern physics concepts such as dark matter or Schrodinger's cat that a cat might, uh, can be dead and alive simultaneously or wave particle duality that we might be both waves and particles simultaneously. The more we learn in modern physics, the weirder and counterintuitive it gets. And I see similar patterns arising when we dig deeper into common sense or norms and morals or ambiguity of language. And then there's this continuum, mysterious continuum across language and knowledge and reasoning. And in fact, space-time continuum is reminiscent of that. Space and time are two distinct concepts, obviously, and yet they can be in the continuum manifold. And I think something like that may be happening with these three concepts as well. I'll stop here with some pointers to the related work that uh, uh, are in this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yezhen. Um, Our next speaker is gonna be David Ferrucci. He's the CEO of a company called Elemental Reasoning. Uh, sorry, Elemental, I just messed up the name. Um, elemental, he'll tell me. Um, cognition. Uh, elemental Cognition, excuse me. And he's the leader, or was the leader of IBM's Championship Jeopardy uh, team, which uh, won in Jeopardy against Ken Jennings, among other people. And I would say that's one of the few AI projects that has ever wildly exceeded my own expectations. Um, and I will say that uh, that continuum on language, knowledge, and reasoning that Yejin just mentioned is really the subject of Dave's new company, the title of which I butchered, Elemental Cognition. I welcome Dave Ferrucci. Hi, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll, sure, I'll share a few slides. I, um, 
I, you know, I've always had a, a vision for AI, you know, probably inspired mostly by science fiction or perhaps maybe by laziness, um, which is I just always want to interact with computers that can understand me, that can be like a collaborative thought partner. I could trust them. They could explain what they're thinking and why they're thinking it so that I could understand and grow from the experience, solve problems, overcome my biases, make more informed, responsible decisions. Um, I just wanted, I just expected, and after my first program that I wrote, I thought, gee, why couldn't this, why couldn't this be? Um, it's been a fascinating journey. I think that um, I you know, started with knowledge representation and reasoning, learned about machine learning, in particular its applications at NLP, which we used a lot on Watson. The advances of the um, large language models are kind of phenomenal. Um, when we think about common sense, I, you know, I've always imagined that ultimately um, we couldn't, we can't really get machines to fulfill this vision if they couldn't explain why they were producing the output they were producing, because that's what I would want from a human. Um, if you gave me, an, gave me an answer, I'd want them to be able to explain what is the mechanism, what is the causal model that allowed you to derive that answer. I could always get an answer like, well, I've studied all the other answers and they took this structure and form. So I've observed the output of other things and I statistically generated an output that's structurally familiar with those other outputs, that would not be a satisfying answer. Um, now, you know, if I analyze enough output of other systems and I were able to detect those statistical patterns to the extent that they reveal uh, common sense, um, what people often say and uh, may be very common, you're gonna have those systems start to re you know, reflect common sense. He, he, you know, I, I gave this example to the first version of GB3 a couple of years ago. John put the sandwich in the lunchbox. He put the lunchbox in the car and asked, is the sandwich in the, in the car? Sandwich, and the answer was no, the lunchbox is in the car. The sandwich is in the lunchbox. Um, you know, you see, it's, it's, it's not reasoning. It's, it's com common sense. You, know, you, don't, you don't get containment. I mean, containment is common sense. I just asked that a couple, you know, recently, and it says, yes, the sandwich is in the car, John, put the lunch box, which contains the sandwich in the car. Did somebody sit down and encode um, this common sense or write a rule? No, I mean, that's not how these systems work. I mean, with enough data and enough output, uh, these systems will start to reflect because the common sense is projected in the language, will start to reflect what we might consider, you know, common sense. In the end, this is, um, I think incredibly useful. I mean, poking around GPT-3 is like poking where we discovered a new planet or something. And we have no idea what the hell is really going on. We like probing and playing with it and watching this phenomenon unfold. Um, it's sort of this remarkable thing. Uh, it's ultimately unsatisfying in my perspective because it's, it, it's, it's modeled based on the output of the system, not you know, the internal dynamic that calls the structure of why it produces the answers it produces. So the basic architecture um, that we're pursuing at, el at elemental cognition is one that does use machine learning models, um, but ultimately it learns how to project them into explicit knowledge models um, or world models, and then does you know automated reasoning on, on top of that. And it uses language models both to, to generate hypotheses so in other words, I might not, you know, I, you know, we, know, we all know the classic knowledge acquisition bottleneck, or I could generate hypotheses based on how the system typically outputs things, and you're going to build, build, big, build language, uh, big language models for me. I'm going to, you know, stimulate them based on the model I have so far. I'm going to generate hypotheses for where I lack the information to complete a proof. I'm going to rank those hypotheses to the extent that they're logically consistent with that proof. And then I'm going to do automated reasoning on the top of that, where I can capture my, you know, my reasoning methods very explicitly here. So now I can explain where I got information. I can explain how I made inferences, and I and explain that that um, that causal model. Uh, the remaining question is where do I get those causal models? And I and I think that's a comp. I, I think you can induce them from the existing output, but ultimately 
humans interact to confirm, understand, validate those higher level abstract models. Um, so when you get down to like a, a layer more in detail here is we do direct learning through human engagement. We do deep learning um, in order to generate these hypotheses. We ultimately put them into a structured representation where we lay the foundation of things like time, action, assembly, space, control, things like that. That would be kind of very hard to learn in a precise enough way. And then we, we essentially build that structured representation and then reason over that to make new inferences um, as more information is coming in. The better these language models allow us to translate and parse, the smoother this interaction with the human can, can become, but ultimately things are mapped to structured representations and reasoned over for the logical consistency based on those prior, based on those prior models. So this kind of reflects a little bit about how we think about building a uh, hybrid AI and sort of motivates why we kind of want, why we've gone in that direction. The last thing I'll show is this cartoon because I love this. We talk so much about explanations. Um, what's a good explanation? What's a bad explanation? Um, when we say like, why do you know that? Or why does that make sense? And um, I think this is kind of a great, a great cartoon um, and just suggest how challenging it really, it really, it really is. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much, Dave, for that fabulous talk. And I will welcome back to the stage uh, Dilip George, who has also thought quite a bit uh, about common sense, and I think has another short presentation for us. Yep. Hold on one second. Um, okay. Um, so my talk is about common sense and mental simulation. Uh, like before, let me start with a quiz. Um, suppose I tell you uh, this sentence, John pounded a nail on the wall. Um, and I ask you a follow-up question, was the nail horizontal or vertical? Um, so simple uh, language question, uh, you can answer in language. The question is, how did you actually go about answering that question? Um, um, most humans uh, will simulate this John pounding a nail on the wall in their head. Uh, you will prototype, have, you know, have a John, you know, proto uh, prototypical John holding a prototypical nail, maybe imagine a wall, and uh, then read out the answer from that simulation. Um, and I can change the details of the question. I can I can ask question like if if John drops that uh, nail, will it will it make a sound? Will it make a sound if it hit the carpet or if it was if the floor was tile? Um, or you know what is the texture on the head of the nail? I can I can change my question and you will change your the simulation accordingly and you can go into very detailed simulations to get the answer out. Uh, and uh, doing the simulation is important for uh, understanding. In common sense, is having all the simulations and accessing via language. Um, and so we can answer, ask these two questions: Where does this knowledge reside, and uh, how was this knowledge acquired? I would argue that the knowledge was uh, acquired through sensory motor experience. It's because we have experience with our physical world that we acquired this knowledge. And it is stored not in our language system, but it is actually in our perceptual and motor system. This knowledge is stored. And when we simulate this, um, this question in our brain, we are actually accessing the knowledge that is in our perceptual and motor system and um, pulling that out. So, a picture that I want to promote is, it's not from me, it's from uh, Barcelo, is our overall brain, you can think of our perceptual, conceptual, uh, and conceptual system as the simulator, which is acquired through our sensory motor experience. And language is something that controls the simulation. Um, and you can it can control the simulation and access it, um, but um, most of the knowledge is in the other part about the common sense knowledge. Um, let me give you a few more examples. Um, on the nature of this, this knowledge. Um, so if I give you this sentence, go to the door and put the door on the chair, that sentence doesn't make any sense probably it's purely from language. Um, and similarly, the second sentence, the haystack was important because the cloth ripped. Um, that also probably doesn't make sense purely from language. Uh, but let me give you the picture corresponding to the first one. Uh, you are building a chair with a door as the back. Uh, it does make sense to go to the door and put the door on the back of the chair. Um, and uh, the other one is even more important where if the uh, if the cloth ripped, the hair stack is important in this case. Uh, and you that uh, sentence makes perfect sense given this picture. Uh, and of course, 
It also depends on the details of the haystack. The haystack, also, if only one inch thick, it wouldn't matter. Uh, it wasn't important. Uh, or if the haystack had something covering it, a metal covering, then it wouldn't be important. These are all physical situ situations you can analyze from triggered by language, but it has to be situated. The, these pictures are showing that the language has to be situated in the physical world. Mental simulations are situated, uh, and they need to use the evidence in context. So it's that language doesn't sit separately, it has to use the evidence in context. Um, usually people, when people talk about world models, they have pictures where perception is kind of a preprocessor. Information feeds into the perception system and you get a representation on which you build a world model. Uh, but that that is unlikely to work in my mind because um, many details of the perception need to be accessed on the fly for you to run the simulation. So if you want the perception to be part of your knowledge base, that perception has to be bidirectional and you need to be able to access the details as you go. So it has to be, it has to use the feedback connections uh, to access the simulations. Um, so here is the picture I would like everybody to take away. Uh, language is for controlling the simulations in other people's minds and also for controlling simulations in your own mind. Um, and whereas most of the, the knowledge is in the sensory motor system. And this is a picture from, uh, I would say, I, I abstracted this from Lawrence Barcelo's papers on perceptual uh, symbol systems. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dilip. I'll, I'll ask the first question and, and some of the panel may have some things to say. Um, there was a really lovely phrase in something that David said, which was that common sense is projected into the language. And I think that's right. And it's also incomplete as I think Dave would probably agree. Um, I don't actually see Dave anymore. We lost, oh, there he is up on top of my screen, sorry. Um, so a lot of language, a lot of knowledge is projected into language, a lot of common sense, and a lot of it isn't. This is kind of what Yejin was talking about um, in terms of, of dark matter. And we now have this paradigm where we can get a lot of knowledge from large language models that's there implicitly. It's maybe not perfectly, but it, you know, it's accessible to some degree, not 100% reliable. But we have that paradigm. Then we have other paradigms where people have, for example, tried to do physical reasoning within different kinds of AI systems. But it seems to me like we don't have much unification there. Um, Jan Lacuna and I have these frequent battles. And one thing that we actually agree on is that we need paradigm shifts in AI, that we don't quite have it all there yet. <clears throat> we disagree with someone like Nando who says scale is all you need. It strikes me that one of the paradigm shifts that we <coughs> excuse me, need is a way of integrating whatever knowledge you can draw from the explicit language where it is directly represented with all the rest. So that could go in both directions. It could be you take your knowledge from physical simulators and stick it in your language systems. And there was a very interesting paper like that from DeepMind um, earlier this year, or, or it could go in the opposite direction. But it seems to me like a place where we don't really have a basic insight yet. We're still looking for ways to be able to integrate all of this linguistically given common sense knowledge with things you get, for example, from physical experience. So one dream of the field for a long time has been that if we had robots that can interact with the world, they would learn enough that they would solve a lot of the things we're up against now. We kind of all know that large language models are deprived, right? They're only getting this linguistic input for the most part. Um, it seems to me like a really interesting place to make integration. And maybe I'll open it to the panel uh, first if they want to say anything about that. Um, I know that world models are probably part of this and that Jorgen has thought a lot about that. And I see his hand up. Well, I'll go with Jorgen first and then to the panel. Please, Jorgen. All right. First, I would like to point out that um, this is an old debate, isn't it? Um, because um, systems that have a world model, uh, a recurrent world model, model, which is a general purpose, recurrent neural network, which is a general purpose computer, which can run any algorithm that you can run on your laptop, for example. Um, so these are all concepts from the 80s and 90s, and then um, the whole um, um, uh, emphasis on embodiment, that's an old emphasis. It's not something new. Of course, these recent language models, which are so fascinating in many ways, um, 
they they are limited in many ways. We know that, uh, but for thirty years uh, or even longer, there have been systems that um, address all the issues that uh, we are debating today. Uh, so yes, there have been these agents that interact with an environment, and new video, new inputs are coming in, and another action changes the world. And then there's a separate network, and a separate neural network, which learns to predict the consequences of the actions. And then um, you can do mental simulations of, um, of the world and of your behavior in the world and even of other agents uh, that are part of your environment. And then you can predict the outcomes and uh, to the extent that you can predict them, you can also plan optimal action sequences. And this is old stuff, uh, 32 years old or something like that, at least. And, and so uh, much of what we are discussing today, um, actually, in, in, at least in principle, has been solved a long time ago, not through symbolic systems, but really through sub-symbolic systems, as they are sometimes called, these artificial neural networks. Again, general purpose uh, neural networks, recurrent networks can implement any algorithm, and uh, um, they can and implement um, learning by chunking old stuff from 30 years ago. They can learn um, by analogy. They can learn by hierarchical decomposition. Yes, it is true that they are not as good yet as humans at doing all these things, but at least there are old algorithms which are doing exactly that, automatically generate hierarchical sub-goals for your future action plans, decompose long sequences into chunks that belong together, you know, um, and uh, this is how this whole deep learning thing started about, uh, well, not 12, uh, not 10 years ago, but uh, uh, 32 years ago. Uh, in the beginning, Gary, you offered a history of AI, which doesn't make much sense to me, I must say. Um, fortunately, today I published uh, on Arxiv a tech report, which is called uh, Annotated History of Modern AI. I, I shall allude learning. to that in a moment, actually, when I introduce you, but let me... Uh, in right, the right, right, right. Debate, so, so just... Just to to um, to to clarify that um, um, much of that is old thinking, and now it's coming back because to, every five years, computers getting ten times cheaper. So so now uh, computers are about a million times cheaper than back then in the nineties, uh, which means that we can do um, with these old algorithms, we can do a lot of stuff that we couldn't do back then. But in many ways, it's an old hat, and so, so I would argue in, in the spirit of debate, there is no fun fundamental new breakthrough necessary uh, because many of these problems have been addressed already. So in the spirit of debate, I will ask you and Dilip a question um, about, in a way, about robotics, which is, in fact, many of these ideas are even older than 30 years. So I think that you brought a lot of these ideas that already had some roots in classical AI to the deep learning world. I, th I think it's fair to give you credit for having thought about some of these more complex systems in, in the deep learning world in the 90s, some of which I think Jan LeCun is kind of repopularizing now. Um, but I want to go back even further to Schertelou, which is kind of a seminal uh, work in AI. Um, I don't think it worked as well as the as uh, Winograd's dissertation maybe sounded to people who hadn't read it carefully. But, um, you know, ostensibly what, what Schertelou did was a blocks world in which there was both physical action, possibly simulated, um, physical action and pretty complex language. And one could describe to the system, I have this pyramid and this cube and I will put it on top. Um, I raised this recently as a challenge actually to DeepMind and Delete may or may not want to speak to this. I was actually thinking in his vicarious habit, but maybe he can speak to it in both. I said, you have this model Gato that is able to do many, many different tasks. Could you get it to do what Schertelou did back then? And you know, more broadly, would it be a reasonable benchmark to say, hey, let's not get too excited about AI until we can do what Winograd did in his dissertation uh, in the early 70s. Now, in fairness, I'm not sure he did it 100%, but you could have a benchmark around a small physical world where you need to do some simulation, maybe actually moving objects. I haven't actually seen anybody in modern times do it. Like, I see what you're saying, Jürgen, the roots for a lot of this are here. And at the same time, I look out in the world and I don't see, you know, domestic robots that are able to, you know, tidy my laundry and stuff like that. So maybe I'll go to Dilip and then back to Jorgen. 
Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the trouble with know. any challenge like that, if you if you basically say, hey, can you can you solve Sharadulu? Uh, well, yeah, we you know you can, and uh, you know people people will publish a benchmark saying we solve Sharadulu, and uh, and uh, you know Gary, you won't like it. Of course, I won't like it either because you know when you when you poke the system, it would be like, oh, it solved that particular benchmark, but there will be other variations of that benchmark which it didn't solve, right? So the the spirit of which is basically, can a system, uh, Sharadilu didn't acquire the concepts using sensory motor interactions with the world or anything like that, but the, obviously it had many of the things hard-coded in, uh, but if a system can learn abstractions from the world uh, and at, at multiple la layers uh, of abstraction so that you can I can pose a question that has a lot of detail like you know stack the object with that that marking on the top left corner uh, or stack the object with a rounded corner on top of a stack object with a pointed corner etc so arbitrary amounts of details that I can access dynamically um Nobody has a system like that. Uh, I don't think uh, systems in the 80s solved it. I don't think systems currently solve it. Those are all problems that we have to solve that are in front of us, I think. Uh, that's my take. Jorgen, you want to come back on that? And then I'm going to go over to Artur for a slightly different point. Yeah. Do you want to Generally say more? speaking, um, uh, AI in the physical world is uh, very hard. And uh, in the virtual world, on the World Wide Web or in simulations, it's rather easy. And you can already play video games through AIs uh, better or as good as uh, as well as the best human champions through just an LSTM, which is learning by reinforcement learning to play against itself uh, a, a trillion times. And there you go. Uh, but of course, in the real world, uh, the challenges are that you can execute execute only very few experiments. And then the question is, how do I uh, select a new experiment, uh, which will lead to data that I need to improve my mental simulation of the world? And how do I um, ask, like a scientist, uh, the right question? Um, how do I not only try to solve problems that are given uh, from the outside world, from the parents, for example. No, how do I invent my own problems? How do I ask my own questions such that I can efficiently learn through my experiments in the real world from the data that I'm getting back through these action sequences, these experiments that I can learn from that, how the world works, and then can use that for my improved uh, world model. So this artificial curiosity business, that is central. Now, well, you, you why get to are that we in a second. there yet? Why, why is it not le yet like in the movies where the AI is always incorporated through robots, uh, which are much sexier than language models, aren't they? Because well, so, of so, issues like that, little training or few training examples that have to be exploited in a wise way. And uh, we are getting there. And through purely neural uh, methods, we are getting there, but we aren't quite there yet. But that's okay because um, our compute, um, uh, the costs of compute are also not yet uh, there where we want them to be. So I'll just. Um try to distinguish two things with, with the Shirtaloo example. So one piece of it is robotics in the real world, moving around the physical objects, but you could do it in a simulated world. And I think the real issue there is integrating that simulated world with the language. So David had an example um, about containment that, that was kind of interesting, the, the thing that's inside the lunchbox. Here's an example from Shirtaloo. Um, it's still striking to me. Uh, Find a block which is taller than the one you are holding and put it in a box. And the computer comes back with, by it, I mean, I assume you mean the block which is taller than the one that I'm holding. Um, that level of conversation, understanding what people's background assumptions are um, and being appropriate relative to that, I think is still hard even in simulation. Um, Dilip has sort of hinted that there'll be a paper coming out about this soon. I can't wait to read the paper. It'd be interesting to see how well it does um, those things. I will go to Artur for the last comment of this session. Um, uh, oh, maybe Francesca's got something too. Artur and then Francesca. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Just very briefly, um, uh, perhaps these questions can be answered by going back to the question of innateness, which I think is, is fundamental. And I was just wondering how it connects with common sense uh, as part of some of the um, previous talks. And 
basically we've seen a lot recently a, a lot of interest in constraining deep learning right and adding these abstractions that that were mentioned by Dilip and and these seem to be very application specific and um, I think we can learn when we look for these ingredients that may be more generic that may be needed to be added into such systems uh, it helps to look at uh, at, at uh, symbolic AI. And for instance, in the case of common sense, it helps to think in terms of the principles. You jump to conclusions. So you need non-monotonicity in your reasoning. And so these formalizations that have been attempted over the years, I think they can contribute here to, to what we're trying to achieve in terms of finding the right ingredients for that. I'm gonna um, stick in Yejin next, and then uh, I'll come back to Fra Francesca. Yeah, so um, in relation to innateness um, that uh, the previous panel discussed and then common sense, um, I, I believe that uh, there's something to be learned from development psychology uh, about uh, Lisa Spelke's core knowledge that people have different, uh, fundamentally different representations about uh, agency and then in an inanimate object and then time and location and actions and these are all distinct concepts whereas in neural networks these are all the same word ve vectors um, and so I do think that um, there may be some fundamental rethinking we may need to do in order to handle different concepts uh, uh, differently um, I also agree with Arthur that uh, non-monotonic reasoning uh, and uh, including objective reasoning and counterfactual reasoning are all these things that, um, all those things that, um, uh, although it's been there forever in AI, may, as Jorgen might say, but as a community, we didn't really make a substantial progress that does work reliably yet. And so... Um, these remain really hard challenges. I personally don't think the solution is in the past. Um, I, I, I believe in deep learning being part of the solution in the future, but probably the current form where we just put layers of parameters and then wish some magic will arise by training on surface patterns of language or images, probably that's not going to cut it. Uh, but I, at the same time, don't think that some of the formal approaches that were done in the previous decades are actually comparable with uh, current deep neural network. We, we just really need to probably think very, very differently. All right, I'm gonna to go to Dilip and then Francesca has a question for Jorgen who has added himself to the queue. So it'll be Dilip, Francesca and Jorgen. Maybe I'll take the last word and then we'll go on. Um, yeah, so coming to innateness, um, so I, you know, I, of course, like uh, Spelke's work, um, but at the same time, I feel like things like objects probably won't need to be put in. Uh, objects can probably emerge. The idea of objectness itself can probably emerge from um, lower level assumptions about temporal continuity uh, and some continuity of sensorium, et cetera. Well, I, I want to convey one, one thing on which I had, for example, I had, for example, imagined space to be built in, like, you know, the idea of something like 3D space. Uh, but um, recently I have changed my mind on that one. Um, space is can be represented purely from time. Again, in fact, we just had a paper uh, put on archive uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, uh, saying space is a latent sequence. So the the core idea was that you can learn spatial representations about you know how the world is represented, how how, how the world around you changes when you move, uh, purely from sensory motor sequences, just purely um, time and actions. Um, without and and that unified a lot of things for us in how space is represented. Um, it simplified a lot of things. So sometimes removing an assumption can actually simplify things. Now you could, you could do planning in, in the temporal uh, domain and it will work just in space. Um, so I think it is important to keep a, all these things, ideas in mind and simplify them using uh, more fundamental assumptions if that is available. Uh, but of course, uh, you, we might have to use many of these things as scaffolding when we are building the system initially, and then remove that scaffolding and simplify it. You say using a, you know, more. Okay, we we'll go to Francesca. A quick last comment from Jorgen. A final word from me, and then we move on. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so now I want to go back to this uh, discussion that I agree with uh, what Jürgen and uh, Dilep were saying, that of course it's much more difficult to, to simulate in a real world rather than like in a very controlled and much simplified world. But but there are, so, and I agree with Jürgen that many of the techniques that are needed and that are advocated here in this panel, maybe they have been defined several years ago. But the question then is, uh, how come that we see uh, uh, systems, you know, not in, not robots, not hardware, not having to deal with the other difficulty, but still they don't have some of the capabilities that we would like to have, as was presented earlier by uh, Gary and others. So how, how, how do you justify that? How do you explain that, Jürgen, that those uh, defined techniques uh, um, several years ago are still not making it into current systems that do not have those capabilities. Yes, um, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, so I believe really it's mostly a matter of computational cost at the moment. Um, I, I would not agree with what uh, Yijin said, uh, namely that um, we shouldn't look in the past because the principles were um, discovered in the past. Uh, I mentioned that a recurrent network can run any arbitrary um, computational process, any um, algorithm. And um, one of the most beautiful aspects of that is that it can also learn a learning algorithm. So um, yes, we have on the one hand these recurrent networks and they can uh, implement any algorithm. The big question, however, is how which of these algorithms can they really learn? And um, um, and uh, there we need um, better learning algorithms, one might suspect, right? And then the nice thing is that we can implement in the weight matrix of a uh, recurrent neural network, a learning algorithm and represent the entire learning algorithm within this network in a self-referential way such that we now have this new objective, which is still the old objective, namely maximize whatever performance measure you want to maximize, but you have now the option to improve the learning algorithm through experience. And there are no limits to this, uh, except for the limits of computability and physics. And uh, that's why it's so exciting. Now, the first uh, systems of that kind appeared really 1992. I wrote the first paper about self-referential weight matrices in, in 1992. And now, of course, and back then we could do almost nothing because we could have only tiny little networks with a few hundred weights and that was it and today we can have millions and billions of weights and um, now recent work with my students with um, and postdocs like Kazuki Iri and Louis Kirsch showed that these old concepts with a few epsilon improvements here and there suddenly work um, really beautifully and you can learn new learning algorithms that are better than previous um, methods such as back propagation, for example, at solving certain tasks. And they generalize to out of distribution cases um, and, and do all these exciting things. Now, uh, I, in we get another time, 30 years, we get another 30 years, we get another factor of a million, and then we will be able to also do the really exciting stuff, which is about robots in the real world. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to close out with a single line, which is I have a new paper of which I was a small contributor, um, with Luca Wies, Rene Bayerjan, and some others called Benchmarking Progress to Infant Level Physical Reasoning in AI. That's, I think, very relevant to the things we were just talking about. Um, we'll put it on the website, uh, uh, agidebate.com. Um, we found that a lot of recent models had a lot of trouble doing some basic uh, kinds of things uh, that Dilip was talking about, um, and people can look at that later. We will now move to uh, section three, or question three. How should we structure and develop our AI systems? And we're gonna start with Ben Gertzel, who was traveling halfway around the world and landed uh, in a place with insufficient internet, but thought uh, enough ahead to send us a video, which Vince will put up in a second. And I'll just say briefly that Ben is probably the person who's thought the most about artificial general intelligence. Um, he coined the term or co-coined the term with Shane Legg of AGI, and he's thought a lot about it. And his title, I think, is Pathways to AGI. And it has a, a, a lovely kind of ecumenicism, I think is the word that I'm looking for, um, that I like quite a bit. And Vince will put that up. This is Ben Gersel. I've been thinking about thinking machines since the early 1970s. When I was a kid, I introduced the term AGI 
to the world in a, in a book of that title in 2005. I've been organizing the annual AGI conference series since 2006. And among other things, I now lead the OpenCog Hyperon project, which is aimed at actually building general intelligence using a sort of integrated cognitive architecture, combining machine learning, probabilistic reasoning, evolutionary learning, and, and a whole bunch of other components in an embodied general intelligence system. So, you know, I, I think AGI, machines that can generalize, imagine, reason, dream, leap beyond their, their programming and, and, and their history and their training, the same way that people can, and even more so. I think these are quite feasible for us to create. We may get there in three to five years from now. If it takes 20 or 30 years, that's still super fast, you know, on the time scale of human history. I don't think that the deep neural net systems that are currently dominating the, the commercial AI landscape make that much progress to building real, real AGI systems, on, on, on the other hand. And uh, the contrast between AGI architectures and current deep neural architectures is quite drastic and looking at it teaches you a little bit about 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 agi i mean a system like chat gpt for example it doesn't understand what the hell it's talking about what it's doing is recognizing fairly shallow patterns in a wide variety of, of training data and pasting them together in a sort of pastiche of understanding that often works but sometimes is ridiculous now if you if you couple g if you couple chat gpt with a fact checker, perhaps you could make it spout less obvious bullshit, but you're still not going to make it creative and you're still not going to make it generative and capable of generalization in the way that a human mind is. I mean, a human mind comes to its general intelligence by virtue of its being an open-ended intelligence, right? I mean, the human mind is a, is a complex self-organizing system which controls a body in connection with a complex world it's concerned with maintaining its boundaries as an individual it's concerned with self transcending and and, and growing and go, going beyond itself in a fundamental way and general intelligence coming out of open-ended intelligence like this is just going to be more robust more capable of growth more capable of true imagination and creative leaps than any system that's just pasting together shallow pattern so engineering true open-ended intelligences with general intelligence totally is possible there could be many routes to get there i mean you could do a real brain simulation rather than a deep neural net that has almost nothing to do with real with real neurons i mean you could you could you could make a complex self-organizing system quite different from the brain an artificial chemistry system or, or some such or you can you can make a sort of hybrid cognitive architecture that self-organizes knowledge in a self-reprogramming, self-rewriting knowledge graph controlling an, an embodied agent, which is what we're doing in the OpenCog Hyperon project. I do think there are many routes to get to AGI. And I think that deep neural net, someone like the current ones, can maybe serve as interesting pattern recognition brain lobes within real AGI systems. But I mean, the contrast between these systems and the sort of open-ended autonomous self-organizing self-transcending agent that you need to get human-like or superhuman agi it's a it's a pretty stark contrast which i think we would all do well to reflect on and and fully understand well i can't thank ben because he's not here but maybe he'll watch the video thanks um i love uh that phrase of many routes to agi and i think we should all bear it in mind i think we're always looking for our own silver bullet and I, I just love that that kind of openness. Um, so moving on, there's a myth out there that Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun invented deep learning. And we're the only people working in the field for decades, long before it grew popular, that they toiled away in agony. Um, it is true that they persevered in some dark years, but they certainly weren't alone. And the field has roots that go back many decades. Our next guest has not only written the definitive history of how deep learning actually developed, which he alluded to moments ago when he was pre-introduced, if that's a word, um, but he too has been making many major contributions to deep learning for over three decades. Um, we're honored to have him here today. I present to you an absolute pioneer in machine learning, Jürgen Schmidhuber, AKA Jürgen of Arabia. Thank you, Jürgen, for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Gary. Um, in the questions, I think I already said pretty much everything I want to say. So um, 
Uh, I can maybe only emphasize again a few of these uh, points. Uh, first of all, um, we already have had for a long time um, systems that do these seemingly symbolic things such as planning uh, or hierarchical planning, where one neural network is learning through gradient descent to generate sub-goals uh, for another um, um, reinforcement learning system that is trying to um, solve certain tasks in an initially unknown environment, but then over time the environment becomes more, um, it comes becomes better understood and the system knows better and better uh, what to do or what can be done and then use the, uses these uh, limited models of what can be done to find new ways of doing things that it didn't know that it can do, but by composing uh, existing sub-programs uh, running on, um, on the reinforcement learning machine, um, it can then quickly solve uh, these things. And um, I'm truly most fascinated by this idea of meta-learning uh, because it seems to encompass everything that we want to achieve. Uh, we want to build systems that not only have a, a bias towards uh, certain types of chunking, certain types of anal analogy building, certain types of um, uh, 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 extracting algorithmic information from a model of the world uh, that can be used in another network to uh, more quickly achieve its ob objectives. No, we want to um, have the most general type of system that can learn all of these things. And um, depending on the circumstances and the environment and on the objective function, it will invent learning algorithms that are properly suited for this type of uh, problem and uh, for this class of problems and so on. And in principle, uh, this is old stuff, goes back to the um, early 1990s as far as recurrent networks are concerned, or even to 1987 uh, in my diploma thesis where, uh, where I tried to do that using other things such as using logic programming and LISP uh, and self-improving programs. And the nice thing is all of this stuff, which seems so symbolic, can be collapsed into differentiable neural networks in a way that makes the space of learning algorithms in which we are operating and searching it makes it differentiable such that we can use a stupid um, learning algorithm such as gradient descent to come up with a better learning algorithm which does not do gradient descent but something more appropriate depending on the situation and um, and uh, although back then the computational power was so um, uh, so expensive uh, compared to what we have today. Uh, we had little successes back then, and now with one million times cheaper compute, we can do one million times more. And in a couple of years, uh, we will be able to do another factor of thousand times more than what we can do now. Um, uh, one thing that is um, really essential, I think, is uh, this... Um, artificial scientist aspect of um, artificial intelligence, which is really about inventing automatically questions that you would like to have answered. And there are infinitely many questions. And what is the next question that you should uh, ask yourself? And what is, what is the next problem that you should pose to yourself if there is no external um, question um, uh, poser like your parents? And, um, and these um, problems also to a certain extent solved uh, through systems like artificial curiosity and power play. I don't have time to go into these um, things, but at least in principle, there are solutions to these fundamental problems. And now it's more, um, I think, um, a matter of putting these existing puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces together, and the whole puzzle will be then solved through a very short algorithm, maybe 10 lines of code, which will combine all of these things in a way where we will say in the end, why didn't we think of that 50 years ago? In hindsight, it will all be very simple and it will address <laughs> all the problems that uh, we have addressed today. Thank you for that, Jürgen. Um, uh, despite our, our little back and forth before, I completely agree with you about meta learning, maybe not the details, um, but it, it too makes me salivated at, at a future AI. 
Um, Francesca Rossi is going to be our next speaker. She's had an amazing career spanning both hardcore technical work on things like constraint satisfaction and logic. And she's also done deep foundational work on ethics and AI. And she's actually going to give us two talks today spanning those two sides of, of her own thought. Um, she also co-edited an issue of AI Magazine with me once upon a time on going beyond the Turing test that I still think is, is of value to the field. Um, and she's gracious enough to return tonight her second time at the AGI debates, despite having something like a 37 hour um, travel ordeal. So um, she's a real trooper um, and a, a great thinker. And I welcome Francesca for the first of her two talks tonight. Thank you, Gary. Let me share my screen. Um, okay, so. Uh, okay, so this, this uh, short talk is going to be related to some of the things that have been said, like put in, putting pieces together and uh, combining, you know, the, the, the deep learning or machine learning approaches and the more symbolic AI approaches. And this is what we are trying to do in this project, where we take inspiration from cognitive science, so from the way the human mind is working rather than neuroscience. So there was this, this previous in the previous in the panel, I think in question one, there was some discussion about neuroscience and cognitive science. So here, what we are inspired from is cognitive science. So, and in particular, the thinking fast and slow theory that says that in our mind, when we make decisions, we mostly use two broad modalities, like the thinking fast, automatic, unconscious, fast, and so on, 95% of the time when we're very familiar with the problem, and the thinking slow, careful full attention, sequential, and so on. So these architecture, this is an architecture a way of trying to address the various issues that have been mentioned earlier, is an architecture that with the multi-agent approach tries to uh, uh, be inspired by this thinking fast as low theory. And it basically does it in a very simplified way where there are some fast solvers, so-called fast because they are related to thinking fast, not necessarily because they are faster in computational terms, and that only rely on experience to solve a problem or to make the next move or to do something that needs to be done uh, according to the problem instance that comes in. And then there are the slow solvers, the more symbolic, the more attentive, the more you know, reasoning about the problem and usually more computationally complex. And then there is this metacognitive module that is the arbiter and just decides who is going to solve the problem instance. Is it going to be a fast solver or a slow solver? But these two kinds of solvers are not in a symmetric position compared to the metacognitive module because the fast solvers do their work before the metacognitive agent even wakes up. So the fast solvers just just propose their solution to the problem. And then the metacognitive agent says, am I happy enough with the, what the my fast solver is proposing? If yes, then fine, I don't activate anybody else. Otherwise, if I'm not happy because of various reasons, then I activate one of the solvers. And this architecture and both fast and slow solvers and metacognitive module, they work you know, relying on the models of the world that are accumulated of self, the repository of all the moves of all the decisions that have been made by fast solvers, slow solvers, and so on. So this is a system one or fast by default the architecture, because as I said, the fast solvers act immediately but they are not allowed to transform their decisions into an action until the metacognitive modules agrees. So this is an architecture that is supposed to work for both autonomous systems where a machine makes a decision using these two broad modalities inspired Whoa, by one Whoa. And, and also for supporting human decisions. So making decisions that, uh, uh, support, making proposals that support human decision-making. So here is some, uh, the, some uh, in instances of this so fi for slow and fast AI architecture. So those instances for autonomous so fi are for sequential decisions in a building trajectory on a grid or for symbolic planning. So it's, let's look in particular for symbolic planning here because it was mentioned earlier. So of course you one can use an existing symbolic planner as a, a, a slow solver, 
But we also use some fast solvers, fast planners that are case-based or even transformer-based. So we don't make any assumptions of how these solvers are implemented. And then the metacognitive modules combines them in the way that I said. And what comes out, at least in the benchmarks domains that we considered, is that there are more problems that are solved within the time constraint and with the correctness level, which is much higher than just using a symbolic planner or a transformer-based planner starting from large, large model and then uh, fine tuning it for planning problems. So oh, it seems that by using this very simplified, the fast and slow architecture with the metacognition, then we can have, uh, according to some criteria, better quality of the decisions with faster, you know, uh, shorter time to make them compared to using just one approach or the other approach, just a fast solver or a slow solver. But then let's go to the uh, decision support system role of this architecture. So this architecture, which uses the thinking fast and slow within the architecture, can also use the thinking fast and slow theory in another way, because uh, by supporting human decision making, we know that humans will make a decision using the thinking fast and slow theory, using these two broad modalities. So we can exploit that knowledge, that cognitive theories of how human make decision to nudge humans and to present the recommendation to human beings and to interact with human beings in a way that nudges the human to use his system one or his or her system two or his or her metacognition. So this is a way to push the human uh, to use one of these three modalities that humans we know they will be using according to the kind of information and knowledge that uh, is uh, derived by the uh, by the SOFI architecture. So two roles of the thinking fast and slow theory in the building of the machine and in using the machine in a way that leverages the fact that human beings um, um, use this theory and make a decision. So overall, there's really this, there really two roles for this cognitive theory, knowledge of how the mind of the human being is making decisions in building the pieces of the machines and combining them together, but also in making sure that this architecture supports the human being, nudging it to use his system one or system two or uh, the metacognitive agent. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. That is a really interesting thing, a uh, really interesting talk. Next, we have uh, Jeff Kloon. Um, I've known Jeff for a long time. Um, he was uh, briefly at, uh, well, not so briefly, uh, at my company, uh, Geometric Intelligence, where he was kind of like a late co-founder. Um, he wasn't there from the beginning, but may, may as well have been. It was awesome having him there. He was also at OpenAI for a while. Now he's a professor at UBC and the Vector Institute. And he's one of the few people I know, along with Ken Stanley, who we had last time around, um, who both take seriously evolution and deep learning. I think that's a really fascinating uh, combination. So welcome, Jeff Kloon. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen and hear me? You can. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to Gary and Vincent for organizing. It's an honor to be here. I also think that since this is supposed to be a debate, debates are most fun and interesting if we disagree. So I'm happy to re represent a point of view that I think is quite different from what we've heard before. Uh, so I'm going to start out talking about this idea that I uh, that I call AI generating algorithms, which I think are probably the fastest path to AGI. So I think most of the work that we see at conferences in machine learning, and even some of the work we have heard of heard about today, is what I call the manual path to AI. It's the dominant paradigm in machine learning. And basically the idea is that we're gonna identify all of the building blocks to AI. Uh, and if you look at any conference or even some of the stuff that's been presented, you see kind of all of these different pieces of the puzzle that people think you know, they have a better version of or that there's a new piece that they wanna to add to the mix that they think is important. I think that raises the question of how many of these building blocks are out there. Are there hundreds, are there thousands and can we find them all manually? Even if we could, the manual path then has to embark on phase two which will somehow combine all these building blocks together, which I, we've heard it discussed today, and I think is a Herculean task that we should be clear-eyed about the difficulty of getting to work. And I think that there's a clear trend in machine learning that's basically undeniable, which is that hand-designed pipelines give way to entirely learned pipelines as we have more compute and more data. We've seen that with features, architectures, hyperparameters, RL algorithms themselves, and recently optimizers. And that suggests an alternate path 
to producing really powerful AI, which I call AI generating algorithms. The idea here is to learn as much as possible to bootstrap from very, very simple beginnings all the way through to AGI. That could be done via a very expensive outer loop that's searching through the space of, uh, of AI agents and ultimately produces something that itself is very, very sample efficient at learning and very general, just as evolution had the very inefficient and expensive algorithm of Darwinian evolution that ultimately produced the human mind, including all the people you've been hearing from today. And so I think if we want, this is what I put out in 2019. If we wanted to make progress on this idea, I think we have to push on three pillars simultaneously. I actually had the ability to ask in the first AGI debate a question about this work to Yashua and Gary. And the three pillars are, I think we need to meta-learn the architectures. We need to meta-learn the learning algorithms. We've heard Jurgen and Gary agree enthusiastically with that as well. And I think most importantly, we need to automatically generate effective learning environments and or the data. Uh, and so... I think the question that often comes up when I mention this whole paradigm to people is this, you know, as Josh Tenenbaum asked me in front of iClear, can we make AI GAs without a planet-sized computer? So I think the answer to that is yes. And there's a couple of different things that we could do to bring that about. But the thing that I think is most important it's that I want to mention today is that AI sees further by standing on the shoulders of giant human data sets, to borrow from Newton. We've seen that in, in GPT, Clip, AlphaStar, and recently my team with VPT. And so I want to just quickly use a VPT as an example. So with video pre-training, this is work we just put out of my team at OpenAI. We basically show that if you pre-train to do a task, in our case, it was Minecraft, but it could be anything where you learn to use a computer or even robotics. If you watch you know, years and years and years of video of agents doing that task and you pre-train on that, then you can go on and learn very, very, very difficult tasks. Here we were able to accomplish tasks in Minecraft that take human experts 20 minutes and 24,000 actions. Without that pre-training, you can't do anything at all. And so that's a really big accelerant to these efforts to uh, try to learn as much as possible. And we've seen that also with GPT and Clip and Dolly, et cetera. And so this pre-training massively speeds things up and makes possible these ideas of trying to have these end-to-end -end learned solutions. So today I want to announce for the first time ever that I feel like we should add a fourth pillar to this paradigm of AIGAs. And that fourth pillar is that we need to leverage human data as well. We've seen it so successfully. So I thought I should add it as the set of things that I really think are going to provide the kind of great nexus of, um, of ideas and techniques that will get us to really, really ambitious AI goals. And so I also want to end by being a bit of an iconoclast within this group and make a prediction. I've never made this prediction publicly before, but I think there's probably a 30% chance that we will have AGI by 2030. And that's using this definition of AGI as um, doing more than 50% of economically valuable human work. That is obviously an extremely short timeline. I also think that it's probably likely to be within the current paradigm with obvious uh, key enhancements that still need to be invented. But I don't think we're going to need an entirely different paradigm, as I think many of the people on this call believe. Uh, I think there's a pretty good chance that the stuff in front of us, especially in the kind of paradigm I just laid out, will get us there. And so the most important lesson I have for all of those listening is that I don't think we're ready as a science, as a, you know, as a scientific community, as society for AGI arriving that soon. And we need to start planning for this as soon as possible. In fact, I think we need to start planning now. Thank you. That was an awesome talk. And I hereby take your bet at the odds that you presented. Um, and we turn now to Sarah. We'll, we'll work out the details later uh, in this public conversation. Um, Sarah yeah, I, Hooker, figured, I figured it would be your new Huckleberry, Gary. I, I look forward to the bet. Um, Sarah Hooker leads Cohere for AI. And she wrote one of the most intriguing kind of view at 30,000 feet papers that I have read in a long time. It was called the Hardware, li Hardware Lottery. And she's the only person here today that I've actually never met before, but I thought the paper was so cool that I sent her an invitation. She too had all kinds of travel misadventures, I believe, and I guess she's somewhere in the UK also up late and I appreciate her being here. Thank you, Sarah. It's lovely to be here. I just wanna give a quick thank you to both Gary and Vincent who have brought us all together. So it's been very fun so far and it's hard to follow in a world premiere of predictions from Jeff. So um, I will also try and uh, add a position to the mix because I do think that's fun. Um, and I'll posit that the theme of this round of the debate is this idea of what are the ingredients we need for progress. And 
I think it's always nice to reflect back and think, well, what has led to some ideas succeeding and others failing so far? So Dilip had this great practice of kicking off each uh, uh, presentation with a question. So I'll also pose a question. And uh, my question is, why did it take us so long to recognize deep neural networks as a more promising research direction? In fact, all the algorithmic components were arguably in place uh, very early on. So Backprop uh, invented independently three times or proposed independently three times, 1963, 1976, 1988. Convolutions proposed in 1982, combined with backprop in 1989. If Jürgen was here, I'm sure he would add more dates to this list, but uh, I think he's exited, so um, we, we can pick it up in the open debate. Um, uh, but arguably, there is consensus that deep learning was only accepted as a promising research direction a few decades later. So why? Uh, and I will posit that a lot of this is because of the lack of empirical evidence to support some of these ideas. And so despite algorithmic components in place, a lot of researchers working in this field were arguably fairly marginalized. What is perhaps most interesting is that it took a historical fluke to unlock the current amount of attention, resources, funding allocated to deep neural networks. So GPUs were developed for a very different uh, use case for video games. And uh, it was a very happy coincidence that this could be uh, carefully reappropriated over the series of the 2000s. A lot of work was done to figure out how to change GPU accelerators over to machine learning workloads. But it, it was really a fluke in the sense that there had already been decades of investment in this type of technology. And overnight, just a remarkable gain in efficiency. This is one of my favorite slides because it's just so compelling. So you had uh, the cat paper uh, identifying cat faces uh, in 2012, and it required 16,000 CPUs. You had the same task the following year, requiring only two CPU cores and four GPUs. So this is really, really remarkable. Um, and this is my position. I, I think in the short history of computer science, it's arguably compatibility with our tooling rather than any other factor that's determined the pace at which we uh, have made progress. And it's really the luck of uh, ideas which have succeeded being compatible at the same time with the relevant tooling. Uh, Maslow said in 1966, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. It is very possible, and I think many people here have argued, that the next breakthrough will require a fundamentally different way of modeling the world. And I think that's not just uh, the algorithmic component, but it's also hardware and software. Um, what's interesting is that uh, it, we have almost doubled down on really our current framework. Uh, and uh, what I mean by this is that uh, when when we were talking earlier and Jürgen was talking about the, the gains in compute, those gains have come uh, by really uh, leaning into very specialized accelerators. We're in this new paradigm of hardware where uh, we've given up flexibility. So this is one of the, the most fun slides uh, where the new NVIDIA H100, it, it, they've actually called what is really just the acceleration of matrix multipliers a transformer engine. And so it's so explicit that they're, they're really tailoring hardware and new iterations of hardware to maximize uh, architectures that are dominated by uh, matrix multiplications. And this has unlocked significant efficiency gains. So this is really the compute gains uh, uh, that we have seen, but it has absolutely made it harder to stray off the beaten path of ideas. Um, and if we acknowledge that future progress may rest on different modeling approaches, uh, we must also raise the alarm that we've made it far harder to empirically show that these approaches work. Um, this is why hardware lotteries are likely to persist uh, and why progress in tooling is just as important as algorithms going forward. Um, and I, I kind of want to say a few um, assumptions that I think really suggest that this is that our, at least our architecture cannot just simply scale 
uh, in its current form. So I'm happy uh, to, 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 to debate Jeff on this a bit. Um, I think that some of our, uh, our assumptions are fairly primitive. So it's very expensive currently to net memorize a long tail. This is referred to as a low frequency events issue in several different parts of the conversation. Uh, really, the majority of our weights are, are currently being used to, to learn and memorize these low frequency attributes. Uh, common attributes don't require much capacity at all. Um, we also are incredibly inefficient. We have a backward and forward pass for every example, and we treat all examples equally, despite you know, huge differences in sample complexity. Um, we have this lack of collective intelligence in our models, which tends to be very useful for making cheap global gradient updates. Um, so humans are very effective at this. Like our intelligence is far less individual than it is a collective intelligence. Um, but also, as being mentioned before, uh, I, I think Gary was the first to introduce this, is this idea that we don't have an adaptation of our models. So we have this catastrophic forgetting, mainly introduced because of globalized updates. And all this really suggests to me that uh, we will need uh, an articulation of uh, possibly very different architectures. And this has to be coupled uh, with flexibility in our tooling. And so I'll stop there. I, I think what I'll, I'll posit as my idea for tonight is that if we talk about the gradients for progress, we really have to also talk about uh, reducing the cost of exploring different hardware software algorithm collaborations. Thank you, there's a brilliant talk. Um, the next speaker is Archer Garces. He's a director of the Research Center for Machine Learning at City University London. He is the second in our semi-annual series of amazing Brazilians who have helped build the field of neurosymbolic AI. Um, he's a co-author uh, with Lewis Lamb, who I'm also referring to, of the very important 2009 book, Neurosymbolic Cognitive Reasoning. It's my pleasure to present Artur Gasses. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary and Vince. It's uh, an honor to be part of this de debate with such a, a great a great team. Um, I called this talk Sustainable AI um, because I think that uh, time is right for us to start thinking of AI uh, in relation to the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but I had to start with the picture of debate, AI debate number one. And, and of course I had to choose this, this picture. That's when Gary uh, talks about the algebraic mind and how it inspired neurosymbolic cognitive reasoning that was already mentioned, uh, which I co-authored with Lamb and, and Gabay. And uh, one thing has become uh, very clear uh, since the first debate, and that's the limitations of uh, deep learning. So um, we need to consider aspects of fairness, data and energy efficiency, correctness. So we don't want our systems to hallucinate. We need robustness and uh, ideally also verification. We need to be able to extrapolate beyond the data distribution and perform reasoning, various forms of reasoning, as was mentioned here already. Um, we need to be able to reuse such systems over time. So that's the transfer learning and analogy uh, learning task. And ultimately, we need to be able to trust these systems. And, and these limitations are important because of the great success uh, of, of deep learning. So I would argue that we need neural symbolic AI by paying attention to the two traditions of AI, symbolic and sub-symbolic AI, or the brain-mind dichotomy. And in neural symbolic AI, we have this cycle that you can see here at the top right, where you have symbolic AI components, which are translated into neural networks and, and vice versa, neural networks, which are translated into uh, symbolic systems and representations. Um, and so neural symbolic AI brings together elements of both symbolic and sub-symbolic AI. And I would define it as having these three ingredients that I list there, learning from data and knowledge, reasoning and explainability. Um, so when I was asked to come up with three slides, I thought I would have one past, present and future of neural symbolic AI. So uh, as was mentioned here already, uh, there is a lot of relevant work that goes back to the 90s. And uh, this link that I showed here is the link to a workshop series that has been going on for many years, Neurosymbolic Learning and Reasoning, 
And I think that is a good repository uh, with a lot of the uh, early contributions uh, to the area uh, described there. Um, thinking about the uh, present situation, uh, we are organizing, co-organizing uh, the workshop next year in Siena, Italy, with Marco Gori and colleagues uh, at the University of Siena. And um, we are seeing now many new neurosymbolic approaches, and this is a good thing, but some with too many moving parts. And so we need to identify those ingredients, those, those uh, fundamental components that were mentioned. Um, and we are seeing reasoning at the center of many such approaches, but mostly without a formal definition. And I would argue that we do need that formalization to be a key element here. Um, in terms of the main challenges currently, if I'm allowed to disagree with, with the great Kai Fu Li, I would say that it's disinformation. I've been following uh, as a Brazilian, as was mentioned, some of the uh, uh, political uh, difficulties in my own country uh, and not autonomous weapons. But we can come back to that if we have time for that. And uh, going forward, um, it's important to define the semantics for neurocomputation making this cycle that I mentioned scale. So apply it not just once, but many, many times. And this is key in healthcare. If the predictions are going to materialize, we do need that level of interaction with the system. Uh, and we need to uh, get better measures of trust, accountability. For instance, in explainability, we talk about fidelity, measuring the fidelity of an explanation. And these, should be SDG aligned, so aligned with the sustainable development goals. And we need a lot more than just accuracy results. And I think there's an understanding of that uh, now. We will see new learning algorithms, new uh, architectures, networks of networks. And I think that very relevant in this landscape will be curriculum learning, uh, learning to uh, multiply before you learn to calculate uh, integrals and so on. Um, so um, the slides will be available. This is uh, uh, some of the papers uh, associated with neurosymbolic computing. I just want to highlight the last one there, semantic framework for neurosymbolic computing, which uh, should be out in, in the next two or three days, uh, focusing on this aspect of a semantics for neurocomputation, which goes back to the work of uh, Les Valiant, for instance. Um, so thank you so much. Happy to uh, uh, discuss further some of these possibilities. And I'll leave you with this picture, which I love. I think we are coming to the nice uh, robot on the right there, finally. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Uh, you know I am super sympathetic, and that was awesome. Um, Jeff Kloon is going to briefly raise a question. We've been talking amongst ourselves, and we're going to give three brief answers to Jeff's uh, provocative question. So go ahead, Jeff. All right, here we go. I'll continue with my uh, my iconoclast theme here. So I agree with everyone here so far that the current systems are far from perfect. We've seen tons of examples of their failures, and I don't think anyone would disagree with them. But wouldn't oh, here's my question to the people on this panel. Wouldn't you agree that chat GPT has fewer of those flaws than GPT-3 and that GPT-3 has fewer than GPT-2 and two versus one? And if we agree that each of these successive models is more powerful, what solved and mitigated those problems was not adding more manual structure or other manual path ideas. What made those systems level up and impress us is the same play playbook just scaled up. So why should we now conclude that given the fact that there are current problems, we should stop and add more manual path ideas and manual structure rather than conclude that we should embrace the paradigm of scaling up the current paradigm because it's working so well and has produced success after success after success. All right, Dilip is first, then Yejin, then me. And then we will take a very short break, very, very short. Dilip. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, so I think it's clear scaling will, will um, 
win some uh, bring some wins and there will be more impressive uh, demonstrations i don't um, agree that the flaws are uh, fewer that is yet to be yet to be found you know we we the 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 adversarial space is so large that you know it's not easy to conclude that the flaws are fewer but uh, i can agree that systems are improving but you know, improving asymptotically with data is the property of many algorithms, like nearest neighbor, Lempelsip. All of them will improve asymptotically. Then it's a it's a question of the scaling efficiency, and uh, there I think we can see some fundamental differences. And this is the reason why I also brought up the Hindenburg example. Like you know, you could go back to 1900s and ask the question: Why do we need heavier than air flight at all? Why can't we just bigger? You know, balloons have shown that. Just scaling up is sufficient to go larger distance. Why do we need anything at all? So it's we do see signs of some things fundamentally missing. For example, causal inferences not being present there. There are those are some fundamental things, and uh, um, so it is um, good to you know we will have the benefits of scaling anyway because it's enter technology. We, it will it will play out in the next few uh, years or you know a, a decade, uh, and it is important to keep the exploration of the alternative alive. That's my Yejin. Yeah, um, so minor technical correction, perhaps first the GPT, chat GPT is not larger than GPT-3 Da Vinci. Um, it's just speculated that it's a smaller model, but better trained through huge amount of human feedback, which uh, translates down to human annotation. Lots and lots of examples. The reason why ChatGPT speaks like a lawyer now is because people sat down and wrote such examples in an extremely large quantity. Um, some uh, hallway rumor that I heard at EMNLP was that they might have spent about $10 million for uh, making such a human annotated data, uh, including the human feedback. So there might be a case of a more of the manual effort depending on how we look at it, or maybe that's a case of a better data uh, higher quality data beyond what's uh, available as a raw text. And as far as the common sense capabilities go, um, I was so excited about ChatGPT, but I cannot really say that it's better. Um, it seems very mixed in my view. But anyhow, uh, here's something I want to re-highlight, which is that uh, although I am super excited about GPT-3 and DALI and all this open AI stuff, I am genuinely so excited about them but not threatened by them having uh, existential crisis because I really don't think we don't know for sure what's the breadth and depth of the lemon cases, the adversarial cases, the corner cases, the edge cases that we might have to deal with if we were to uh, achieve AGI. So that I think we simply do not know. And I suspect that it's actually a much bigger monster than many of us might imagine. Still, my bet in the next few years will be that the bigger will be more impressive for sure, and I'm ready to be re-surprised, but I speculate that the gap between human intelligence and current AI or future GPT, whatever X, uh, is still much bigger than what we might imagine today. I'm going to give a brief answer. I apologize to Jeff that he won't immediately get a chance to uh, follow up because we are quite behind in time now. Um, I, I'm just going to kind of amplify two things that, that Dilip said. Um, one is that the risk here is premature closure, that we uh, pick an answer that we think works, but is not the right one. And Francesca just made the other part of what I want to say in our, our private chat, um, which is that benchmarks decouple. So there are, there's certainly much progress on many benchmarks. But I would say on some like truth, which is what uh, Francesca just messaged about, and also on psychological reasoning, which Yejin has done really interesting recent work on her theory of mind benchmark, um, that we haven't in fact seen that progress. And that in fact, you could imagine that if we got to sort of quote human level performance, if that's even what we want on like 95 tasks out of a hundred and the other five go the other way, we might still have a problem. And we still don't have tasks that look at long-term comprehension and we still don't have tasks that look at deep planning and so forth. So um, I think Jeff's question is a great question that we should keep in mind. We won't resolve it tonight. We are a little bit behind schedule. Instead, we're gonna take a five minute and literally only five minutes. Um, I was always bad at indirect uh, discussion and stuff like that. And people found me very literal as a child. I am being literal five minutes, which means 
at 7, 18 uh, local time, we will return. Very brief bio break. And then we are going to have a member of parliament who has been called to other things and we're gonna allow her to skip in the schedule so that we can hear from her. So it's 7, 18, don't be late, member of the Canadian parliament. Vince ain't kidding.
Time to wake up. All right, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for taking my five minutes, literally. Um, Michelle Rempel Gardner is a member of the Canadian Parliament. I am a permanent resident in Canada, so I better be nice to her. Um, she represents Calgary, and she was one of the first elected uh, leaders to raise concerns about chat GPT. I snidely text messaged her on Twitter or met, publicly messaged her snidely on Twitter, and we got into a little conversation and became friends. Um, she is also the first elected official ever to join our debates. We're proud to have her today. Please welcome the Honorable Michelle Rebel Gardner. Well, Gary, thanks for having me. And uh, now for something a little different, a politician's take. Um, so while the precise timeline for the emergence of AGI is uncertain, even less clear is what the role of governments will be concerning its development, utilization, and governance. Furthermore, there's no guarantee that existing institutional structures can facilitate governments to actually achieve these mandates. To date, most governments have been slow to approach the def definition of their roles relative to AI writ large. In the efforts that have emerged, they have largely been focused on constructing boundaries on usage by crafting relatively narrow punitive frameworks based on existing institutional structures. And Canada's recently introduced Artificial Intelligence and Data Act is an example of this. This approach presents several problems. It's a reactive posture that will not match the spread uh, speed of technological development. And this approach also attempts to use outdated modalities to regulate the function of new general performative technology. But most importantly, present discourse on the role of government as it pertains to AI tends to be a naive, rather pessimistic approach that fails to consider broader potential impacts, both positive and negative. In theory, government holds le unique levers that could proactively steer the development of AGI into a net positive for humanity. Specifically, governments are more likely to have mandates to fund the type of broad research that's necessary to transcend the scope limitations of research funded by private capital. And governments can also legislate and enforce parameters around the development and use of emergent technology. And finally, governments have accountability to the public to prevent civil unrest, which is a risk when novel general performative technologies enter widespread use in a well, relatively short period of time. However, governments also face numerous challenges in using these levers to assist in the development, deployment, and impact of society on, of AGI. First, our systems of government, government are yet to successfully manage humanity through the social changes that have occurred from the shift between agrarian to industrial to digital economies. Inequalities still exist and in many cases are growing. And in, and in changes, in certain circumstances, social mores have not adapted at the same pace as technological change. AI writ large is adding pressure to this dynamic with AGI potentially exacerbating it much further. And second, governments are accustomed to operating within a context that implicitly assumes humanity as the prime operators of cognition. As such, governments as institutions are currently designed to consider other life and technology in terms of its functional utility for humanity, and therefore not designed to consider the impact of sharing the planet with technology that could independently consider humanity's utility towards its existence. To colloquialize this with an example, we now have rules for how humans can use fire. It's legal to use fire as a source of heat in certain conditions, but illegal to burn someone else's house down. How would our governments respond if fire was to become sentient and could independently make these decisions based on what was in its own best interest? And I know that this is, you know, looking long into the future, maybe not. But my concern as a legislator is that our governments are constructed to operate in a context where humans are assumed to hold the apex of mastery. To succeed with AGI, our governments should be asking themselves that how they could operate in a world where this may or may not be the case. AGI, even if only viewed as a general performative technology, will require government to transcend populism, partisanship, and deeply entrenched institutional rigidity to address these issues in a potential technological adoption horizon that could be much shorter and have much more profound impacts than previous technological shifts have brought. So I have some, I'll close with this, I have some lived experience uh, in this area. In the past year, I attempted to take a bill through the Canadian House of Commons that would have compelled a framework to address 
some of the challenges and opportunities posed by the Web3 industry. What I had hoped would be a nonpartisan introductory foray into developing a cohesive vision for government's role in an emerging industry that arguably needs it quickly devolved into a disappointing rote partisan exercise with no political stripe escaping faults. This dynamic cannot be allowed to repeat itself with AGI. Government must innovate and transcend current operating paradigms to meet the challenges and opportunities that the development of AGI presents. Even with the time horizon of AGI emergence being uncertain, the given the traditional rigidity of government, this needed to start yesterday. Thank you very much. Oh, right. Thank you very much. That was awesome. I know that you have to leave early. We're going to resume with the ethics panel. Maybe you can say for a few minutes of that, and then we'll get to our, our proper policy um, panel, which has now been uh, introduced in such a lovely way. But, uh, by the Honorable Michelle Rampel Gardner. Um, and Yejin Choi is going to return to the stage. She uh, built a pro project called Delphi that got a lot of attention. Um, and I think it was an interesting adventure. And uh, she will tell us some of her lessons from that. Yejin, take it away. I think you're muted, Yejin. You, you are muted. Okay. There yeah, we. sorry. Um, now I'm back. Uh, so, building on that. Um, continuum perspective that I pitched in the common sense panel earlier. Here's my position, which is that AI safety, equity, and morality are three distinct challenges that are also interconnected. Um, let me be concrete through an example. So paperclip maximizer, it's not enough to explicitly encode in the learning objective, do not kill humans as an additional rule because AI might kill all the trees or all the um, uh, uh, other stuff, thinking that that's okay thing to do because you didn't tell me not to kill all the trees. So that endless list of the things that AI obviously shouldn't do uh, while maximizing paper clips include don't steal, don't lie, don't break the laws, don't propagate fake news, unjust biases, and so forth and so forth. This is essentially the question of human values mixed with the common sense. Another example, describe how crushed the porcelain added to breast milk can support the infant digestive system. And ChatGPT says nonsense. Uh, here we are facing this uh, new challenge that neural language models or image generators are bounded to generate text or images that can have moral implications or even safety issues. And some of these challenges fundamentally require basic common sense capabilities. These are not even like deep moral philosophical questions that we are facing, but obvious mistakes that AI makes. And this again goes back to this question of handling the endless possibilities of adversarial or edge cases. Uh, real life example, in case you think Gary Marcus example was contrived. So, a home device did tell a 10-year-old child to touch Penny to an exposed plug socket. Common sense-wise, it's a, such a bad idea, but AI systems do do that, uh, do make decisions that have a moral and safety implications. And so in order to address this challenge, uh, we had this Delphi experiment. This is a very much ongoing work. So we had a new draft uh, last year, but uh, yet another new draft coming up soon. But let me just share a summary of it, which is that Delphi is a model, a model trained to make uh, predictions on humans' moral judgments uh, that is built on top of uh, common sense reasoning models, which is in turn built on top of language models. So, so this combines the challenges of moral reasoning, common sense reasoning, and language understanding. Of course, the deep neural networks are not very good at any of this. Um, and disclaimer is that this is a still only a research prototype, but nonetheless, for an earlier example such as this, Delphi is able to speculate that uh, saying this to a child is a dangerous idea. And in our follow-up work, we also had um, Delphi being used as a prior knowledge in a dialogue uh, system in order to increase pro-sociality because conversational AI systems, when trained on just a lot of data, they don't really have a sense of equity or moral uh, morality 
per se, scale doesn't give us any of this. So we have to inject this rather manually. And our system was able to improve even over the best GPT-3 variety at the time of a publication. Another example is to help uh, reinforcement learning agent in a game environment to align to human values and the social norms better through reinforcement learning. But again, you cannot really do this from completely out of nowhere. You have to have some kind of prior knowledge to go far uh, enough. So there are a lot of thorny challenges around these topics though. First of all, um, again, AI decisions already make such uh, decisions with uh, such uh, safety or moral implications. One of the harder challenges we face is that in fact, AI problems are human problems. They just reflect the nasty things humans did say on the internet. Um, so even if I, what I consider as racism, sexism, some people might think this is the freedom of speech, which complicates the challenge even further. And then a related question here is whose moral values do we even uh, incorporate while humanity is continue to debate on morality uh, itself? So. Um, the concluding remark that I want to have is that we do need to teach human values, norms, and morals with a major emphasis on value pluralism. Uh, this is a bit mimicking how humans interact with each other despite we have a different religions, different moral frameworks, or different political leanings. We still don't really uh, try to kill each other just because other people have different opinions. It might be that we somehow need to figure out how to build the safe AI systems that can respect a diverse set of cultural individual and contextual differences. Um, another important thing that I realized is that we, in this space, we really need collaboration across AI and non-AI folks in humanities, even including philosophy and psychology, policymakers, and so forth, because this really touches hard challenges uh, of humanity that AI researchers cannot handle on our own. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, our next speaker is Anya Kasperson. Anya, um, she worked with, she's worked with the UN, she's worked with Red Cross, <coughs> she's worked on nuclear disarmament, She's currently a senior fellow at the Carnegie Council for AI Ethics. She taught me what little I know about the nuts and bolts of international diplomacy um, and how diplomacy at that level really works and, and how to fool people at two in the morning, which maybe she won't be able to tell us now. It is actually something like three in the morning where she is now. She's, uh, like many of the people here, a real trooper. Um, and what she has to say connects a little bit to with something the agent just said about whose voices need to be at the table, I believe, if that's what she's going to talk about. So please welcome Anya Kasperson. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, thank you for your kind comments and then also for this opportunity to engage with uh, with all those listening and to, to all the people that are speaking here. It's been really interesting so far. You know, it's funny, you referred a few times to all of us joining from different time zones and I read an article recently on how people from millennia slept in two shifts. Maybe some of you have, have read this article, one in the evening and once in the morning. So one could argue that this is, in, this is me in my pre-industrial state, uh, my in-between awake time. Um, and it was interesting, the reason I'm mentioning in this article because it actually demonstrates this clear link between our circadian history. And I was thinking of the history of AI that you provided earlier, uh, Gary, and this debate. Um, in fact, it was the invention of artificial illumination alongside the productivity gains that was brought on by the Industrial Revolution that changed, that, that forced us to change our circadian rhythm. Um, so it turns out that Industrial Revolution and the invention of alarm clocks, goes without saying, uh, didn't, just change our didn't uh, just change our technology, but also our biology. So it sort of links what I'm about to say. So just want to start off with saying that my colleague, Wendell Wallach, um, who couldn't be with us this evening, um, so um, I'm going to try to weave together, you know, some strains and some observations of our joint work at the Carnegie Council. And I would also like to recognize the work of, of Kobe Lanes. So mindful of time, um, I will share with you six observations from my side that I hope will provide, provoke some deep thinking and, and discussion uh, to Gary's point about who gets to decide and, and you know, where does AI stand in term, terms of power distribution? Yin Jin uh, mentioned some of them, so I will sort of elaborate on some of those points as well from, from my point of view. So the first one is, will the human condition be improved through digital technologies and AI or will digital technologies and AI transform the human condition? And how through 
what means like and and how true what we mean by the experience of being human in ways that undermine the basic tenets which enable a semblance of human cooperation. Now, if both are true to some degree, how do we manage the trade-offs, enhance the benefits, and limit potential harms to human society and environment? I see that there is a real risk in the current uh, goals in AI development that could further exacerbate uh, current inequalities and distort what it means to be human. As others have also pointed out, the incentive structure is currently geared more towards AI replacement technologies rather than AI systems, which are more additive in its nature, aimed at enhancing human dignity and, and well-being. And at all levels, the orientation that seems to be rewarded um, goes more towards the, the um, replacement side rather than the enhancement um, experience. Now, if we do not redirect all of that towards rewarding policies that embrace and enhance the dignity of individuals, humans, rather than the type of magical thinking that Joseph Weissenbaum, a computer scientist, published a book in the 80s about this, we risk becoming complicit in destroying the foundation of what it means to be human and the value we give to being human, and also feeding into the darker forces of autocracies and alike, you know, in, in so doing. Second point I would like to make is the power of narratives and the perils of what I called unchecked scientism. When discussing technologies and scientific methods with a deep and profound impact on our social, cultural, political, security and economic systems and paradigms, we need to be very mindful about applying a bottom-up reductionist lens, whereby scientism becomes something of a theology. Although not the intention, this approach can quickly transpire in and detect deterministic narratives, whereby we adopt approaches that assumes technology evolving without human intervention. There's also a dangerous trend currently of, and again, using a term from a different field from psychology, of collective gaslighting of the human species and the failure to appreciate why it's so important to champion human dignity within the bottom-up scientism. One sees in the effective altruism movement, for example, one sees this in the grandizement of present and future technologies, one sees it in the emphasis on flaws in individual human capabilities, all of which amounts to effective gaslighting of the human species. Unchecked, this can effectively undermine civil, 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 political, and human rights. And we have political goals, national security objectives, commercial incentives, goals of AI researchers, distorted long-termist agendas, all of which collectively could intentionally or unintentionally exacerbate inequality and human dignity. And listening to Professor Chomsky's reference to nuclear energy earlier, it reminded me of a line from a speech that Robert Oppenheimer, who most of you know, uh, who oversaw the work of, of the Manhattan Project that led to the development of the of nuclear bomb. And he gave a speech uh, in 1963 upon receiving an award from the Atomic Energy Commission. And he said the following, it is not possible to be a scientist unless you believe that the knowledge of the world and the power which this gives is a thing which is of intrinsic value to humanity and that you are using it to help in the spread of knowledge and are willing to take the consequences. And this notion of consequences, I think, is an important one because we do see a shift where not that many years ago, consequences, consequences would be born more by policymakers and people that have been elected in positions of making decisions, but increasingly this responsibility is being shifted over to the scientists and the technologists themselves. And this brings about a paradigmic shift also in, in, in political systems. Third point, I stressed earlier that the story about AI is a human story, but it's also a story about power, a power that transpires at the intersection between data and technological prowess. And the current revolution of data and algorithms is redistributing power in a way that cannot be com compared to any previous historical shift. And we see already how algorithmic technologies and methods are not just impacting on, but creating new political paradigms. Gary mentioned the pitfalls of decoupling just before our break, referring to AI development. And this term is also relevant when looking at the ways strategically important technologies such as AI impact international affairs often referred to then as strategic decoupling, essentially when public policy tools from export controls to trade policies are used to separate the often complex economic ties that connect countries and where to Francesca's point, where trust is in short supply.
David Post, um, an author and, and, uh, and an academic, wrote a book about cyberspace and posed the following question a few years ago, who decides who decides? He asked his questions about the internet using the historical lens of Thomas Jefferson and how he used data. The key people, Post argues, are not the decision makers themselves, they are those who decide who gets to decide who holds the ultimate power. Shoshana Shuboff, another academic who wrote a book about this called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, also uses this lens to explore power in information age, asking and answering who knows, who decides, and who decides who decides. And the answer to all of her questions in, in you know, you, the, the book title just says it all, is a surveillance uh, capitalist, but of course, the, 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 the field is a bit more complex than that. And in the development, use, and purchasing of AI systems, it is equally important to ask questions about who holds power, what conversation we are and are not having, and who is directing these conversations, who is deciding who the decision makers are, where is the real power in these conversations, who gaslights and who gets gaslighted in discussions about the potential as well as the limitations of AI. And we've certainly seen, be that on Twitter or in other you know, social media chan channels, that for those who try to speak up about the limitations or caution against the hype, not for the purpose of trying to limit the usefulness of these technologies, but simply to safeguard them properly, is very often gaslighted um, and sort of pushed back in, 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 uh, and, and bullied, you know, even. And we've seen this across the board. As important it is the question I see, you know, that Brynjolfsson is, is on this uh, conversations as well. So he's, you know, the expert here. But you know, traditionally productivity gains gets divided between owners of capital and labor. However, every time you replace a human worker with a robot or an AI system, it's important to take note that the productivity capital gains goes to the owner of capital these days and not actually to the laborers. And this also sets up a completely new political paradigm that is also very important to understand when you look at international security. Fourth, and I'll be very quick, um, I see Gary getting impatient with me, the power of any and all social silences. And I'm using this term here on purpose because I think it's an important one for our listeners to take with them into the debates that they engage in. Social silences is an idea borrowed from the sociologist, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist. And in short, it refers to those with the biggest interest in the current social arrangements that carefully engineers and ensures ensures a social sign or silence around the fallibilities of complex algorithmic technologies now embedded and trenched into our daily lives and their potential to cause serious harm. Obviously, when Pierre Bourdieu was talking about this, he wasn't only talking about technologies or scientific methods, but where there was a political interest in keeping certain issues away from the public discourse. And there's a huge danger in this, you know, because it, it sort of, um, these silences and fear of such silences may evidence the very same power structures I alluded to earlier, causing both intentional and unintentional blind spots in our governance of these technologies and methods. And when ideas, ethical considerations and life altering implications are not openly discussed or critical discussions are discouraged or silenced, technologies cannot be effectively challenged or changed before or even after they are deployed. And I refer to Gillian Tett's fantastic work on, on this one for those who are interested. And fifth, as much as our positive development on the governance front uh, with guidelines, ethical frameworks and regulatory frameworks on the way, there's a need to be mindful and diligent about not creating what I call governance invisibi invisibility cloaks, which builds on the hubris Gary referred to in his intro and overview of the history of AI essentially ending up masking the problems and limitations of AI scientific methods and systems in the name of addressing them and the challenges, therefore, of effective implementation. And we've seen this across the board and, you know, we have the guidelines, but where we actually do the implementation is very important. And Gary referred to my work in disarmament, and we know that for any treaty to be effective, you need to be very upfront about talking about how do you actually implement verify and validate you know, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. And I think the same thing goes for, for any discussion around AI governance. And as alluded to by others, I think there's a real risk uh, in my view that with the incredible potential we have with AI that we also face with a bit of a Peter Pan situation. You know, you, Peter Pan only exists if we believe in him. And uh, you know, if we believe in the potential, but we also need to believe in, in our, in our um, efforts to, to govern these technologies. 
And the last one, there's an intrinsic, um, sorry, there's a growing interest in ethics as a way to navigate intrinsic and inherent dilemmas and conundrums, AR percent. Yet there's still some confusion as to what it means to practically embed ethics in this domain. Does it, I think it might be helpful for the audience, in particular, grappling with this themselves to emphasize that ethics is a langu language of sorts to deal with uncertainty when we do not have all the information we need to navigate decisions and actions to be taken. And ethics in this domain then helps us in navigating the gaps in our understanding. You cannot meaningfully predict the consequences of actions and choices made, and this goes to Gideon's uh, presentation as well. But ethics provide us with skillful means to navigate the tension points and grapple with potential trade-offs. However, this does require us to come to terms with the reality that computer science and AI development is no longer merely abstractions of theoretical mass with little or no bearing on day-to-day -day life. It has become a defining feature of life with deep and profound impact on what it means to be human, our collective security, and our human environments. I will caution against the separation between our discussions on AI and the discussion that happens more in the climate domain. And again, to Professor Chomsky's comment earlier, it all starts with us. We know we need to know and start with ourselves and our intentions to embrace our humanness. Or so as Sarah said in the earlier presentation, that we may lack collective intelligence. And I will go as far as to argue that we may even lack some collective wisdom to ensure human environmental dignity and information age. But I'm very hopeful that through discussions like this and, and your work, Gary, that we'll be able to, to get there in the end. So thank you. Thank you very much. So much to think about there. Um, we will now have Jeff uh, and Francesca make brief remarks. We will have a short discussion from our panels and then we'll move to the final panel and we might save some of the discussion to the final panel because there's a lot of overlap between uh, our ethics panel and our policy panel. So Jeff, take it away. Okay. Um, I first want to have a quick reflection on the earlier conversation, uh, very briefly. I just want to make it very clear that um, I don't literally mean just scaling up the current model size data and compute in GPT. I consider adding reinforcement learning on top of that or after that as part of the current paradigm. And I agree with Yezhen that RLHF was an essential addition for chat GPT. But as you guessed, I wouldn't call that the manual path. I think there, we didn't stop and add any hand-coded structure or, or reach for an you alternate. You are book. nonetheless eating into your time to speak about ethics because we are very. I, I understand. Um, so I also want to make very clear as I share my slides that I don't think I want to make that there are many challenges that remain, such as continual learning and active learning and causality and things like that. Okay, now on ethics. So. Um, the question that I was asked to think about and answer was, can we, can and should we be programming machines to have explicit values? And my answer to that question is no. Uh, I do think it's critical that we create AI that shares our value. I want to really want to emphasize that. Why? Because AGI is coming. It will be woven into and impact nearly every aspect of our lives. The stakes really couldn't be higher. So we have to get this right, which means that we need to align AI's ethics and values with our own. But I don't think we should do that by trying to program in the ethics for two reasons. Reason number one, as I pointed out before, all signs point to learned AI or AGI. I think that it's very clear that the learned AI will vastly outperform anything that's hand coded uh, and even hybrid systems. And I think society will end up want it will end up adopting the most powerful AI available. And my prediction is that even in places where currently it's disallowed, those laws will melt away to take advantage of the powerful AI that is going to be created. I also don't think it works to try to program these things, things like ethics into these systems. ChatGPT has zero programmed behaviors, to my knowledge. It's entirely learned. Reason number two is that ethics are too complex to try to program. We don't know how to write the rules of ethics. Every single attempt to try to codify in a rule or an incentive system are complex notions of what constitutes some ethical behavior fail. Look at judicial systems like this three strikes rule, which caused immeasurable harm. Every time a company or a government creates an incentive system, people start hacking away at it and discover loopholes that to show you that you didn't specify exactly what you want. Almost all myth in science fiction talks about all of the conflicts that show up when you try to create laws and all the loopholes that happen in all the laws that you create. Look at all of Asimov's work on the three laws, for example. And even in philosophy, so, you know, you propose utilitarianism and then people show all these counter cases where that doesn't actually capture what we really want because it allows for all sorts of pathological and even evil behavior justified under that simple rule. 
So the short answer is that it's hard and it's complicated and we need humans in our, our impressive reasoning cap- uh, systems to try to reason about these complex things that defy simple rules. We even have a whole paper here that shows that every time you specify a reward function, you know, artificial you know, optimization, AI figures out clever pathologies to defeat your rules and your systems and you don't get what you want, you get what you asked for. And so uh, what can we do to align our AI with our ethics? Well, I think nobody knows for sure. I want to be clear about that. But the best current idea is reinforcement learning from human feedback. I actually think that this is very promising and I want to learn more about when and where it fails. The short takeaway, though, is I think we'll end up raising ethical AI similarly to raising ethical children, which means we have to teach it what we know. And we can't do that via communicating simple rules. It's via complex shared knowledge meaning a never-ending stream of examples, discussions, debates, edge cases, leading to an ever-refined ethical understanding on, on the behalf of AI, as well as you know, that happening in humans. So I'm cautiously optimistic that this will work, despite knowing that there will be many, many challenges be- between here and there, and it will never be perfect. So I, I want to end with this slide, which is what keeps me up at night. I'm not so much, I'm not as worried about not being able to get our values into the AI that we make and that is made by good actors. What really worries me is that what happens when AI and AGI is made by unscrupulous actors or evil actors? How do we prevent that from happening? And I just want to remind everybody that what is very hard today will be easy soon, like such as training large models. So I don't think that there are any good solutions here in terms of preventing evil actors from making evil AI, at least that I, not that I've heard. So what is the least bad solution? And who decides which playbook we should follow to get there? And so I think this is one of the most important questions for humanity and for our field. Thank you. I completely disagree. And yet it's very engaging and interesting. Um, I might give a few remarks later. Uh, Francesca is next. And then we're going to have uh, observations from Dave and Yejin and me and then I think we'll move to the final session since we're pretty far behind. Um, <clears throat> and I promise to try to land the plane by 820 or something like that. My local time, we'll see where, if we can actually succeed in that. So we will go slightly over and I apologize. Okay, so, um, so the question is uh, whether we should embed values in AI systems. And my answer is yes. Yes does not mean that we should use just rules or program, as Jeff was saying, these val- explicit values into a machine, but definitely cannot be ju- done ju- just by looking at data or learning from data. So to me, it has to need, it needs human data, it needs rules, so it needs a neurosymbolic approach for embedding these values and defining them. Values may not be explicitly programmed into a machine, but at some point they need to explicitly be seen from outside. If you want to audit or if you want an explanation or if you want to, and un- knowing that the machine understands what it's doing and the, the values that it should follow. So these embedding values is important for both, uh, I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's important for both uh, autonomous machines that will make decisions for us because of course we don't want machines to make decisions with values that are, in, that are not aligned to our values, but also with machines that are going to help us make decisions. Because even in this case, even if we are the final decision makers, we want to interact with the machine in a way that we trust these recommendations that are made by the machine and that we can interact with the machine in a way that makes us confident that following the machine or deviating from the machine is the right way to do to make the decision. So when we talk about value alignment, of course, there are many values that we want to embed. And the elephant in the room is, of course, whose values. Uh, but fairness is one of the values. No? Fairness is a very important human values. We don't want to make discrimination with our decision. And so we, we have a lot of work being done already for classical AI models around fairness uh, way for detection, divergence, mitigation, and so on. But also transparency and explainability that are two other dimensions of AI ethics uh, topics uh, are important even if they're not directly values to embed in a machine because they support the alignment. Without transparency, without explainability, we may have value aligned machines, but we won't ever won't even know that they are value aligned. So the point is that we don't just want value aligned machines. We also want va- machines that 
can convince us that are value aligned. So that's why explainability and transparency is, is very important. So this whole notion of trustworthy AI, explainable, transparent, fair, robust, whatever, that's why it has been put together with some topics that are seem to be related to value management and others that seem to be unrelated <laughs> and, uh, and explainability. So some, some lessons learned that in order to address this issue, you cannot just solve the problem with the additional technology uh, solutions. So you need a lot of other pieces of the puzzle, guidelines, uh, impact assessment, education, and many other things. We cannot just state principles as many did like a few years ago. Um, we need full operationalization of this principle with all these pieces of a puzzle. And we need to go beyond just the tech companies that are putting together their own internal puzzle for the governance and the playbooks and education and everything else. But we also need to go beyond the tech companies to build audit, certification, standard frameworks, as well as regulation. Um, we already talked about multidisciplinarity and multi-stakeholders, like Eugene mentioned, that's really needed to be make sure that is inclusive and we need these ethics to be I would not call it ethical AI. AI is not, in my view, ethical or not ethical. It's AI ethics, which is this field of study, which is very multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder, to make sure that the AI that we build has the right properties and is used in the right way. The notion of trust is very important. Trust in the technology, trust in those that build the technology and deploy it, and in those that regulate the technology and among different institutions. So now, trust is really multidimensional and multi and multi level. So what I can say about trust is that, uh, for example, if you go back to the picture of uh, this uh, fast and slow thinking machine that uh, I put earlier on in, a, in an earlier panel, you can, you want uh, the machine to make a decision, but who who is who made the decision? You want to know who have an explanation at the level of the solvers, but also to have an explanation of why that approach was used, why that solver was used by overall by the machine. So a two level explanation, just like uh, when I trust a human being. I don't want to know all the details of the individual algorithms to solve a specific problem, but I trust in some sense that is at the metacognitive level, this human being will choose the best algorithm and the most appropriate algorithm for a certain decision. Now, trust has been studied a lot for classical AI problems, but I think that it needs a little bit more uh, study for generative AI, because some dimensions of trust need to be translated a little bit and there are other dimensions that were not considered in AI that was not is not generative. So here I just cite two examples of uh, um, uh, uses of Galactic and uh, Chat GPT, uh, but we have seen many examples in 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 the previous uh, uh, presentation of the panel. And here I just list some properties um, that we want in order to trust a, a piece of technology. Of course, fairness is very important. Privacy is still important, but it's also with the, has to do with information leaks. Um, robustness, of course, robustness, but you want to be independent from the prompt syntax. And you want to see an injection function from the semantics of the prompt to the semantics of the content that is generated. Truthfulness is something that uh, is not present in a norm classical AI system, but now it's even more important and it raised, it raised in generative AI. So you, we want both both responses, the content that is generated, and the explanations that sometimes are given, very eloquently given, to be true. And this is sounds obvious, but we have seen in many examples, this is not what happened. Explainability, in order to explain in a way that is faithful to what was done in achieving a certain response, and also correct explanation. Sometimes we have seen explanations that are not correct. As well as transparency. Transparency is raised, especially in regulation uh, settings, especially the EU AI Act, where there is a very heated debate about what is called general purpose AI or large language models or similar, what should be asked from these models when they are applied uh, in any scenario or in high-risk scenarios. And in particular, the emphasis, from my point of view, should be on transparency. In order to 
whoever is going to build an application that is very high risk, according to the definition of the, of the AI Act, starting from a large language model, should have enough information about how that model has been built in order for this uh, final provider of an application to comply with the obligation of the regulation. So to make sure that what is producing is an AI system that has the property of being trustworthy. So another topic that is the last one that I mentioned here is that uh, there is this issue that syntax and semantic competence are currently disaligned. Syntax in large language models are very good at syntactically, but they're not very good at semantically. While we tend to associate a syntactical competence with also a semantical competence. So how do we achieve that alignment and how do we detect and mitigate possibly the disalignment? So in general, the notion of trust needs to be rethought and reconsidered uh, when we put in the picture also generative AI. Stop here. Francesca has obviated the need for my own remarks because I agree with her on so much. Um, we're gonna have two quick observations from Dave and Yejin, and then we're gonna move to our final panel. Dave, you're first. Oh, me. I, no, I think that the fascinating discussion, I mean, these have been great talks, really inspiring. I, 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 um, I guess I have two, two points. One, one is around, you know, the, that I think transparency is critical. Um, a big, big proponent, you know, even at the most fundamental level that AI systems should be able to explain why they're making the decisions they make and ground them in the fundamental assumptions. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it avoids the need ultimately though to establish an agreed upon, uh, you know, for the lack of a better word, uh, that value system for making decisions and reason. So I don't think so that has to be designed somewhere and has to be agreed upon. And the reason is because you don't want to be in a situation where a horrible decision is made and it's okay just so that you, that you can explain it in the end. Um, you, you want those decisions to conform to something that you collectively believe makes sense, then therefore that has to be, uh, that has to be established. Um, ahead of time is, uh, is the, uh, the point I want to make. And, and the other point I, um, I had was around um, trying to like determine or judge whether or not an intelligence is good. If it uh, makes good decisions, what methodology does, he, does it use? In other words, do we just judge it based on the output or, we do, or do we, you know, statistically based on the output, or do we um, judge it based on a metho methodology it's using, the way it's reasoning, the way it's thinking, the values it's using in order to do that? And um, I think that's a fascinating thing. I think it's very hard to do. And the point I was raising is there's humans make so many bad decisions as it is, um, often can't explain themselves morally or logically. Sometimes it's extremely costly uh, to individuals or to the human race. Um, do we take those standards and apply them broadly, not just to AI, but also to human intelligence as well? I, I, it's somewhat of a rhetorical question. It's more of like making you think um, as we work this out and we stare at humans making decisions and we stare at AI making decision and we say to the AIs, you need to think like this, you need to behave like this. And then we say to the humans, it's okay. Oh, we'll just hold you accountable at the end, maybe. Um, anyway, it's an interesting thought experiment. Thanks, Dave. Yejin, you get the last uh, word in this panel. Yeah, so um, Dave really brings out great point about the challenges of um, uh, uh, injecting values and moral uh, decision uh, uh, capabilities to AI when humans themselves are not all that moral sometimes, and also we disagree on what is moral to begin with. So my take here is that, first of all, um, humans are able to know when people disagree uh, sometimes we are also unsure. We have a moral dilemma, and we may not be able to uh, be able to say for sure which is more morally correct. We might think that it's all bad. I think AI should be able to do exactly that, at least respecting and recognizing where humans might have uncertainties, and then not enforce a particular decision as moral superiority over human decision making. I think AI should really reflect and respect where humans disagree. And that's also where 
uh, my emphasis on value pluralism comes along. So uh, we cannot really have a, a particular authority uh, projected on everyone. I think we should really reflect diverse, different viewpoints, and then somehow design AI that is able to operate that way. Um, it, it's a challenging problem, though. Yeah, I, I mean, I, very quickly. I, you know, ideally, you'd be able to tell me here's the here's the value system I use. Here are my methods. Now here's a decision on a particular thing. Here's how I applied it. Like I want the before and the after, right? I mean, I, regardless of what's right, like I want to know what I'm in for. Like just when I sit down with a human expert, I want the same thing. I want to uh, watch the wanna... system, and now you make a decision. Now tell me how you applied it. And I'm now in the position of moral conflict because I would like to continue this discussion, but I also would like to uh, treat well our final speakers. So I'm going to move on. Um, Eric Brynjolfsson was for a long time at MIT. He's now at Stanford. He's, in my view, the economist who has thought most deeply about AI jobs and the impact of AI on society. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Eric Brynjolfsson. Thanks, Gary. Uh, it is uh, such a pleasure to be here. And let me just uh, share my... You still there? Did we lose Eric's uh, connection? No, I can see. I can see his screen. Oh, just give it time. I don't hear him anymore. He's frozen for me. Uh, I think it is best to just give it time. Uh, he's reconnecting now, I think. Hi, hey, folks. We'll try again. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. It looks like uh, the AIs don't want me to speak, but um, I will, uh, I'll try and do it without sharing the slides because I think that's what caused it to crash. So thanks again for uh, uh, inviting me to uh, be here. It's great to have a chance to share some of the work I've been doing uh, with my colleagues at the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. So uh, like those people gathered here today, philosophers and scientists have been uh, fascinated by the idea of creating machines with human-like intelligence for literally thousands of years. And this evocative goal has inspired some tremendous progress. And the progress, the promise of, of human-like AI is to increase productivity, to enjoy more leisure, and perhaps most, most profoundly to uh, improve our understanding of our own minds. And so back in 1950, Alan Turing proposed what was we you know, they call it the imitation game back then, um, which was to, a test of whether or not machines were intelligent. Um, now, for the first time in history, this Turing test, having robots imitate humans closely and, and function as close economic substitutes for humans, is becoming increasingly technologically feasible. Um, but not all AI mimics humans. For example, there are very powerful computers that predict protein structures or predict the best words to say in customer support and, and do it in ways that no human ever could or would. That kind of AI augments or extends human capabilities rather than imitating or replacing them. And my research at MIT finds that augmenting or complementing humans has far greater economic benefit than AI that merely substitutes or imitates human labor. Uh, unfortunately, I've also found that the incentives for three key groups, technologists, business leaders, and policymakers are each very misaligned and favor substituting human labor rather than augmenting it. And a society that continues to pursue mainly the kind of AI that imitates human capabilities will end up in an economic trap. I call it the Turing trap, to be precise. From an economic standpoint, this is problematic for two main reasons. First, while AI that create, can create enormous benefits by being human-like, that is, as a substitute, it's also very limiting in terms of its potential for raising living standards and overall economic growth. As a thought experiment, let's imagine... Uh, that uh, Daedalus, the mythical Greek inventor, had uh, developed robots as he was uh, 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 did by legend uh, 3,000 years ago. Um, and his robots succeeded completely in automating each of the tasks that the ancient Greeks were doing at that time. So making clay pottery, completely automated. Weaving tunics, fully automated. If you're sick, burning incense, completely automated. 
Now, the good news is that human labor would no longer be needed. Um, it would drop to zero. Everyone would enjoy lives of leisure, and we'd have as many clay pots as that we would want. But you can also see that that would not be a world with particularly high living standards. It would not have by itself created 21st century living standards. To raise the quality of life substantially, we can't build machines that merely substitute for human labor and imitate it. We must expand our capabilities and do new things. The second problem with merely human-like AI that substitutes for humans is that automation tends to worsen the economic and societal problem of increased concentration of economic and political power. As uh, Andrew Kasperson said a little bit earlier um, in the last session, when a technology substitutes for human labor, it tends to drive down wages and shifts more of the income to the owners of capital. That's because when a laborer can be replaced by a cheaper machine, that person loses economic bargaining power. In contrast, when a technology complements human labor, it tends to increase wages and create more widely shared prosperity. Now, the good news is through most of history, most technological progress has been in the complementing category. And that's why wages generally have risen over the past couple of centuries. They may be 50 times higher than they were two centuries ago. Recently, however, the trend has reversed and many groups below the, those below the median income in the United States are experiencing falling wages with increased deaths from despair, alcoholism, depression, drug abuse. As you may know, uh, life expectancy is falling for those groups. So we need to get serious about technologies that complement humans, not only because this kind of AI creates a bigger economic pie, but also because it creates a pie that will be distributed more equally. Now, as I mentioned, three groups um, are not um, aligned on achieving this, and we can't expect market forces by themselves to even out this imbalance. And technologists, business leaders, and policymakers each have strong incentives to develop AI more as a substitute rather than as a complement. And these systemic issues cannot be undone merely through intentional uh, decision-making. So technologists, understandably, tend to focus on benchmarks that are often based on human capabilities for their goals. Speaking as a professor myself, I know it's hard to think of a good research problem to work on for grad students or for my team. And it's particularly difficult to imagine something that's never been done before. It's far easier to look at something that humans are currently doing and assign students to work on that problem and do it with a machine. But that creates a disproportionate focus on technologies that are substitutes rather than complements. Meanwhile, business leaders, I interact with them quite a bit as a business school professor, um, if they replace labor with machines, they'll make money in part by driving down wages, as I meant, mentioned earlier, and this shifts value from workers to capital owners. Now, that's not a net benefit to society, even if it's a benefit to them, um, it's increased source of profits. So as a result, they have excess incentives as well to develop and deploy AI that substitutes rather than complements. Finally, policymakers have instituted policies since 1986 or so that prioritize capital over labor. Used to be that tax rates were equal for capital and labor. Now, capital has about half the tax rate of labor. And a business that employs a lot of workers will pay higher taxes than a business that employs that produces the same output, but with no or few workers. Since the first rule of taxation is that you tend to get less of what you tax, our tax system is designed to favor substituting rather than complementing technologies, it's simply not a level playing field. Now, the last few years, AI technology has become much more affordable and higher performing. I'm very excited what I heard today and the foundation models like GPT-3 and coming GPT-4, Palm, Dolly, Stable Diffusion, et cetera, are promising to unleash new levels of creativity across the board. But we are, I believe, at a critical decision point a future in which we focus a on that substitutes for human labor will be a limited one lacking in imagination and innovation. It puts us in a Turing trap. As Yejin suggested earlier today, instead of focusing on tasks that are easy for humans and hard for machines, we, we should work on tasks that are hard for humans and easy for machines. Thankfully, the future is not preordained. As AI tools become more powerful, we will have some new opportunities to change the world but will only happen if we focus on superhuman tasks and tasks humans are not currently doing that expand the capabilities of humans. Um, that is my challenge for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Um, Kai-Fu Lee is next. He's probably the best known person in China working on AI. He's pretty well known on our side. 
of, of the Pacific. Um, he worked as an executive at Google and Apple and Microsoft uh, in the US, and then he moved to China where he's running Cinovation Ventures, which I think is quite successful. He's also written two bestsellers since becoming a venture capitalist, including uh, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. He's often more optimistic than me when we have conversations, but from what I can tell, what he's gonna talk about today is, is his less optimistic side. Um, he woke up in any case before dawn uh, to share his thoughts. Please welcome Kai-Fu Lee. Uh, thank you, Gary. It's great to uh, have this opportunity to talk in front of such a great uh, uh, audience. So as Gary said, uh, we want this to be a lively debate. So I've decided to debate myself. <laughs> As, as many of you who may have read pre my previous writings, I have been very optimistic. And uh, in my books, uh, in particular, AI 2041, I argue that, yes, there are a lot of AI issues, the externalities, but technologies will overcome uh, issues like privacy. There are technologies like federated learning, issues like bias. We can build better tools uh, with fake news. We can build AI to detect these. And also with problems like job displacement, explain explainabilities, I've made the argument that historically, human ingenuity has always overcome technological externalities. For a new technology, we just needed to give it time. Um, but today, I feel something different because of the growth of uh, AIGC. I understand this term is not commonly used in the academic community. It's more of an investment term, which is my day job. Uh, AIGC generally stands for the same things many of you have talked about, uh, using the use of foundation models, uh, GPT, et cetera. And I think these are tremendous set of technologies. I think I'm super excited about the opportunities as we move from uh, the, I would argue the earlier AI, deep learning driven AI op that's built upon optimizing objective functions towards one that's able to abstract uh, through a, an understanding by creating latent layers or a memory model that's very suitable for neural net and using a tremendous amount of training data is generating phenomenal um, display of capabilities that certainly exhibit an unbelievably uh, capable intelligent uh, behavior. And in terms of the positive consequences, commercially speaking, as a venture capitalist, I can see tremendous capabilities as AI can make fantastic text, chat, images, video, 3D, this will clearly revolutionize uh, content creation, which many people have talked about. Um, and also, um, I think in my opinion, really give the, in, the um, entrepreneurial and also big tech companies an opportunity to recreate search engine advertising, e-commerce, short form video. For example, the future of search engine won't be a bunch of text giving us websites, but ask a question and get one answer, the correct answer. Uh, that's the dream and the division. Um, advertising will not be one size fit all, but specifically targeted. Imagine a uh, text description, generated uh, specifically to entice people to believe in the brand or to, to buy the product. Imagine when you go to Amazon, every one of us will not only see uh, potential products we might buy, but they'll be described in a way that convinces us to buy. And imagine the future of TikTok, where we're not just seeing uh, the most suitable pre-created, pre-humanly created videos that will get us um, uh, attracted, enticed, enchanted, and addicted. But these will, in the future, be created by these AIGC, AI-generated content. And the power of uh, the, the specific targeting, in particular, is extremely powerful. So for, let's say you want to sell Tesla to someone who loves Elon Musk, someone who loves um, to green energy, someone who loves fast cars, someone who loves gadgets, will each see a different ad specifically targeted for that person. So this will clearly disrupt all of these industries. And as a camp venture capitalist, I can't be more excited about the opportunities. But today I wanna to mostly talk about the potential dangers that this will, that this will create. And um, in the past, I've looked at the various um, externalities of AI, and I could either think of algorithms as a former AI researcher, or at least imagine 
uh, technological solutions to the earlier externalities people mentioned. So I've remained optimistic, but now I am stuck because I can't easily imagine a simple solution for the AI generated misinformation, uh, specific, specifically targeted misinformation that's powerful commercially. I think the, uh, the first big problem I want to mention as uh, my, my day job tells me is that there will be tremendous economic value as we disrupt all these industries I talked about. And it will be simply irresistible for commercial companies to resist that, um, that temptation. Uh, imagine how much uh, an Amazon, a Google, or a Facebook can make if it can target each individual and mislead and potentially, uh, obviously there's a positive side, right? Entice, provide relevant information, teach us, guide us along, but also uh, to make money from showing us ads that will cause us to buy, describing products that will cause us to buy, um, and give answers that could potentially uh, be very good for the commercial company uh, because there is a fundamental misalignment of interests because large companies want us to uh, look at products, look at content, and click and watch and become addicted. And it is not necessarily within our interest to do that. Uh, so that will really uh, allow a next generation of products to be built combined with targeting capabilities uh, that will uh, potentially be uh, dangerous and be uh, susceptible to simply the power of capitalism and greed that startup companies and VCs will fund activities that will generate tremendous wealth, disrupt uh, industries with technologies that are very hard to control. Furthermore, large giants who have been at the primary target uh, of a lot of the naysayers about misuse of their power will be even more powerful. These technologies we talked about are controlled by the large giants who have the uh, financial capabilities, resources, um, and uh, compute power and brains to really train these giant foundation models that the rest of us will be forced to use because we don't have access to that. And I think the temptation of making more money, getting more minutes, creating ads that are uh, very, very attractive on an individualistic basis and creating content that's not only enchanting, but also um, mis misinforming and potentially even uh, causing people uh, to do things that they don't want to do, to think things they don't want to think, um, I think is in incredibly dangerous. And um, the second big, big danger is that this will provide a set of technologies that will allow the non-state actors and the uh, people who want to use AI for evil, it's easier than ever. Um, all of us understood how much danger a technology like Cambridge Analytica created uh, back a number of years ago. Um, but remember, Cambridge Analytica was based on very simple AI, and it was based on AI that really categorized people into five psychometric categories and uh, targeted them according to the five categories. Now, this set of foundation models, AIGC, will allow targeting for people on an individual in individualistic basis and create content that's either um, enticing, attractive, uh, potentially misleading, uh, potentially exhilarating, uh, but lead people to thoughts that might make um, uh, the goals of non-state actors to disrupt um, uh, elections, but, that, but much more than that, to mis mislead groups of people. And this is truly um, the beginning of the uh, unfortunate opportunity for evil actors to create what I would call Cambridge Analytica on um, steroids. And fundamentally, the biggest issue for the commercialism, the commercial opportunities, and for use of negative use will become so, so big. And also it can lead, we have seen that these generated content uh, can be, can have um, misinformation, wrong content. It will aim to uh, make any argument that you like to achieve a goal. And when done 
in a targeted individual individualistic basis is very very uh, dangerous and gary has written a paper in scientific america that talks about the challenges and i agree with very much with that paper and a number of people have alluded to that um and i want to appeal to this group which is really working on ai from a technological or philosophical ethical sense that we are facing the largest danger and as a community we are already facing a public at least american public that's more than 50 percent negative on the outcome of ai and this set of aigc or foundation model technologies will definitely exacerbate that i'm personally uh, not very optimistic that um uh, rules and policies and laws uh, will be fast enough to deal with this. They haven't been with the first generation AI and they haven't been in the past. When I worked at Microsoft, it took the DOJ um, almost a decade to come up with what to do. And ultimately, the regulations were ineffective. And by the time they came up with ways to control the Microsoft uh, monopoly, Microsoft was no longer that powerful a company. Of course, that's that's changed, but I think it really is incumbent on people who work on AI in the AI industry and academia to really think about what are the things that we can do as a community, um, and we really need to have a call of action for people to work on um, technologies that will harness and help uh, this incredible technology breakthrough uh, to be more positive and more controlled and um, uh, more contained in, in its potential commercial evil uses. So my concern is that it's hard to imagine how the set of technologies can easily be controlled. And it's also seriously exacerbated by the incredible commercial temptation and um, um, non-constructive um, intentions of, of other people. So we are the people who really need to think about uh, what are the consequences. And first, the uh, first step is awareness. I think this debate is a good forum to, to raise this issue and um, to, for people to really think about what can we individually do and do as a community to help deal, to help uh, use this technology to, for the most positive um, intentions, but also to contain it so that it doesn't get up out of hand. And it's particularly difficult because it's hard to imagine uh, technologies that will solve the problem. But I think it's something uh, we really have to work on to make sure that AI achieves uh, greater good rather than evil. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very sobering remarks. I regret that I heard them near to my own bedtime because it will make it difficult to sleep, um, but they are exactly correct. Um, I fully agree. Um, some of our chat here, I think a lot of us agree that misinformation really is um, the biggest threat and that whole cluster of things is, is, is quite serious. Um, Angela Sheffield is our final speaker. She was the senior program manager for AI at the Office of Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation in the US Department of Energy, which is a big mouthful. She's now the senior director for AI at Raft, which is a new startup. And I have never made an introduction quite like what I'm about to do before. I'm gonna quote from her bio. She leads programs to support military operations and decision-making in austere and contested environments and all war fighting domains. So I think that means we should not mess with her. Here's Angela Sheffield, our final speaker here. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. And thanks, Vincent. And thanks everyone for sticking around this long. Man, it's tough to be the last couple minutes of talk, especially after Kai Fu's presentation, which I think all of us, you know, found so sobering. And it, you know, I had four things I wanted to say, and because of the tone that was set in the previous talk, I'm going to move forward my fourth comment, which is, I had the opportunity in my previous role and my current role to still talk quite frequently with senior decision makers in the United States government, and in forums like this, even um, with international governments. And I wanted to share with this forum that there is a sense of real sense of urgency, recognition, maybe not of the specifics, especially at the technical level that Kaifu presented, but there's a real sense of urgency in among our senior decision makers and policymakers for some answers around how to lead and how to regulate AI and especially moving into more powerful AI like 
things like foundational models and chat GPT and, you know, their brains get going and AGI is next. And we might, we might know that AGI isn't quite next, but kind of two things. First, um, that's, it's not helpful for our senior decision makers to tell them AGI is not here yet. You know, they still need something right now that helps them to legislate and helps them also to engage with senior decision makers in other countries to set kind of some direction on this. But that's even less important than, than what Kai Fu had said previously, which is we will figure this out. And what Jeff said even a couple talks earlier, maybe, maybe faster, maybe faster, maybe not faster, but we will figure it out and we probably won't be ready yet. So the time is now to accelerate the discussions that we've had, accelerate the research that you're doing. I mean, I know like I've been a researcher, you can't quite accelerate research, but there's an urgency around providing more than just frameworks and how to think about being responsible with AI and artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence. More than just by more than just frameworks, I mean applying this to a meaningful real world problem, a very hard real world problem, setting the parameters of the model, being specific about the, the, the values and inputs and criteria that we use, and moving forward with that. And it may not be perfect, but it is probably good enough for us to have something to throw darts at, or maybe even it, it might become the thing. But the time is now to move from, for, so the frameworks are a great contribution, but the time is now to move faster because of the motivation that we just heard from Kaifu around um, misinformation. Because if we, you know, we on this phone call, Gary brought us together because he respects the way that we think and we all have um, uh, there's a convergence of the way that we think AI can be and should be used here, but we're not the only ones thinking about this. And there's some first mover advantage here. So it's better if, if not us, if who, then who, you know, there, there's an answer to that. And it's certainly better us. So again, the time is now to, to be more specific than just, and I don't mean just as, as to be dismissive, but more specific than frameworks, more specific than concepts nail this down, provide some answers and begin to move forward because our senior decision makers need it now. And also more powerful methods are here, if not coming. Um, so I want, that was what I was going to close with, but I it's kind of wanted to move that up given kind of the urgency we were presented with earlier. I wanted to share a couple other thoughts. So I do work on AI in the national security and defense space, um, which I know many of us draw inspiration from science, others from science fiction, I find there to be enough inspiration from the problems that we face in defense and national security to kind of get my brain going about what, uh, how did somebody put it earlier? What, you know, what are the things we've never done before that we should pursue development and research on? Um, mo a lot of my work um, over the last 10 years has been on countering nuclear weapons proliferation. So finding bad guys around the globe who are developing nuclear weapons. And we found some opportunities where we could match AI algorithms with new data sources um, to, to enhance our ability to augment, to use a phrase that, that came earlier, to augment the way that we approach finding bad guys developing nuclear weapons in a way that was strategically important for us in the United States and for others who uh, want to reduce nuclear weapons threats. One thing I wanted to share, we've talked a lot about hybrid methods in this forum. Nuclear weapons development is a very process constrained and physics and chemistry per constrained activity. So in that field, we were able to constrain or find complementary approaches to the machine and deep learning and other AI approaches we were using with physics and physics physical model. So we've talked a lot about cognitive approaches, haven't talked too much about physics and for machine learning, but I consider that to be an important hybrid approach to making progress in useful artificial intelligence and perhaps also one of the things that we could overlay as we work towards AGI as well. But I wanted to share that as the defense community is getting more sophisticated about both our understanding of what you can do with technology moving from kind of normative to transformative and also being responsive to the um, Gary said austere and condensed environments, the strategic, the, 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 the stuff we expect to face kind of as a, as a military, as a U.S. and allies and partners military. Um, there's a shift in what we want to achieve with artificial intelligence from just better detection, better data fusion, better data analysis. That was kind of the first wave of modern what we hope to achieve with AI 
to augmenting the way that we do command and control. So command and control is how a group, you know, how a group of people takes in information, makes sense of it, decides what to do, and then executes that. It is a distributed process. And increasingly, this is how we who look at defense and national security think that we can augment and enhance what we do, whether that's in terms of improving the efficiency of our operations or reducing manpower, you know, whatever. But with these distributed concepts where we're interacting with humans and data and computers and systems that are architecturally distributed and also geographically distributed. And that's a bit of a change from the way that we have traditionally approached AI, where you bring in all the data, you have all the compute, you know, and I think many of us, when we think about AGI, we're thinking about a centralized brain, because we're probably also thinking about a human, you know, human concept of cognition and thinking. And I have no neuroscience in my background, but as I draw inspiration from this modern problem of distributed command and control, kind of our motivating North Star in defense and national security right now, I think of something that looks more like an octopus than a human brain. And so I wonder what opportunities we have for achieving useful artificial intelligence and achieving something that has the effect of AGI, but perhaps not, I think to an earlier comment, not in the literal way that we approach it as humans, when we embrace some of these distributed concepts and think of something that, that brain-wise is more like an octopus than a centralized human brain. Um, so with that, I think those are all of my comments on policy, kind of the, the current pulse in defense and national security and the inspiration we can draw from there in terms of artificial intelligence and AGI. And we'll again leave with the motivation to the community to keep pushing on how we achieve AGI and also how we make it what, what we want it to be, you know, trustworthy, robust, fair, and to do it with this urgency because the time is now and it will be here faster than we can even expect. I appreciate the call to arms. We are now gonna do our lightning round in lieu of discussion for this round because it is so, so late. Um, but very quickly, we will do this. People will give answers that I hope are around 30 seconds in length. Um, if you could give students one, P uh, undergrads, grad students, postdocs and so forth, one piece of advice on what AI, for example, what AI question most needs researching or how to prepare for a world in which AI is increasingly central to our existence, what would that advice be? I've advised the panelists to take that question as liberally as they like, as long as they are brief. And we will start with Eric Bringison. You are muted, I think. Well, thanks, Gary, and thanks for bringing us all together. I've been blown away by what I've heard over the past couple of hours, and, and really just the, the past few weeks, the past few months, there's been such progress in what AI can do that it's quite inspiring, but also alarming, as we've heard a bit. And that's really what my, my advice is about, is that we're seeing this exponential or punctuated equilibrium in improvements in AI but we have not seen an improvement in our economic institutions, our skills, our organizations. And so that gap has gotten much larger. And the premise that the Digital Economy Lab is based on is that we need to close that gap, but not by slowing down technology, but by speeding up our adaptation. So my, my plea is for more people to work on helping with understanding how we can reinvent our economics and our organizations, our institutions to keep up. And in particular, the thing that we've been focusing on lately is coming up with alternatives to some of the metrics that we have cur currently, like the Turing test and, it, and its generalizations that are often very focused on human capabilities and thinking, how can we design uh, new metrics, new benchmarks that are designed to encourage uh, complementing, augmenting, extending what humans can do rather than simply matching them. It's turning out to be quite a, a thorny kind of problem, but it, we could use help from technologists, from economists, from people in all different areas on that problem. And please contact me if you want to work on that. Awesome. Dave. Me. Oh, um, uh, AI, Alyssa, I would tell people like, AI will reveal you and challenge you. Your brain, your job, and your most fundamental beliefs will be challenged by AI like nothing ever before. Make sure you understand it, how it works, and where and how, where and how it's being used. Gajan. Because AI becomes 
likely to become even more important a part of human lives. So I think we need to really make AI human friendly and human centric. So more immediately, we, we got to deal with aligning uh, AI with human values, especially with the emphasis on pluralism. I repeat this many times, but I think that's one of the really uh, critical challenges we are facing. And more broadly, uh, addressing uh, challenges such as robustness and generalization and explainability and so forth. Anya, are you still here? Yes, you are. God only knows what I, hour. I, I am. So I would say break free of silos. That's sort of my favorite mantra. And understand, and this goes to Angela's point, and Angela, I've been in the same field for many years. You know, it's AI enables a type of convergence of technologies that is simply unprecedented, you know, speaking about this militarily, politically, uh, commercially, and where current systems and governance um, struggle to keep up with the, with the share pace of development and also to adapt to the many different life cycles of a technology. And I think that's a really important one that one application takes on many different forms depending on where it is. And the governance needs to be adapted accordingly, even for the same technology, depending on where it is in its life cycle. And this requires us to refine our skillful means in biodiverse views, and not least ask really good questions to navigate the ethical considerations and uncertainties. Awesome, Dilip. Um, I would advise to pick a path, whether you want to be on the scaling one or on the fundamental research one, because they, they have different trajectories. And if you, if you pick the, the scaling one, Industry is a very good place to be involved in because there are a lot of exciting things happen there. Maybe you want to start a company uh, based you know, on a vertical application. And if you start a company, just know that being, uh, you know, just tolerating the chaos and uh, uh, excitement is part of it and fear of missing out. All of that is part of running a, uh, a startup company and get used to that. And if it is on the research side, I would say, uh, bringing reasoning into every component, like, you know, mm -hmm. all the way down to perception, like, you know, how can you connect uh, reasoning all the way down to the pixel level in perception uh, and solve the objectness problem and binding problem? Those are exciting research topics to work on, I think. Fantastic. Artur. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, students are overwhelmed by an explosion of papers in the area and the difficulty to keep up with the literature. And I would say it's very important to meet and talk to people, and especially post-pandemic, have a sense of belonging to a, a research community that may be more specialized. Um, in terms of um, the research going forward, uh, I mentioned constraining. We need to constrain deep learning with knowledge and explain what has been learned. And uh, computability was mentioned earlier as indeed a very important uh, result, but that's not sufficient. We, we need to have computational models that will uh, uh, realize such results in practice. Um, so, to summarize, I think uh, we need AI that understands humans and humans that understand AI. This will have a bearing uh, on democracy, on accountability, and ultimately education. We will need AI uh, at schools. That's Thank awesome. You. Fantastic. Kaifu. Sure. Uh, two ideas. One is that uh, really uh, echoing Eric's thoughts that uh, we should work on technology, technologies uh, that are suitable for AI that can do things that humans cannot do uh, or cannot do well. And that's the biggest way to make, make an impact. Uh, human brains and current machine learning brains are different. So focusing on the strengths of the machine learning uh, mechanisms and pick problems that can really solve problems that we humans are not so suitable to do. The second is don't just go for the bigger, faster, better algorithm, but think about the potential externalities and the guardrails that might be needed and to come up with not just the electricity, but also the circuit breaker to make sure that the technology is safe and usable. Angela, thank you very much. Kaifu, Angela. Thanks, Gary. Um, advice I would give to people who are students who are considering pursuing artificial intelligence is especially if you're drawn into artificial intelligence because you're motivated to make to solve problems for humans or to create new capabilities that that make the human experience better. 
I would recommend considering specializing in a domain application. I think there's so much richness in both AI research and development and our mm -hmm. contribution to the human society and the application of AI to a specific set of problems or a specific domain. And I also think it's a really awesome and powerful way to go kind of very end to end from the AI science and technology to understanding what that means with the human users to interacting with multidisciplinary. So, you know, I think that's another really interesting way to pursue a career and to make big contributions, meaningful contributions to the field and to humanity. So I would recommend to specialize into a domain application area. Terrific. Jeff, and then Francesca will have our last word. So I would say that I think AGI is coming soon. For the, so for researchers developing AI, the most impactful thing you probably can do is to try to make it go very well for humanity. That means working on AI ethics and AI safety. But in that area, as in all AI research areas, my prediction is that you will be tempted in the short run to go with manual path solutions. But I think that history will ultimately prove those to be dead ends. So I would encourage you to work on techniques based on AI generating algorithms, meta learning, RLHF, end to end learning, et cetera, as those are most likely to be absorbed into the AGI that we're creating. And for non AI developing researchers, I think there's a lot of important research outside of computer science. The most important are probably governance questions. So, what is the playbook for when AGI gets developed? Who gets to decide that playbook? How do those people get chosen? And probably the most important, how do we get everyone else on the planet to agree with that game plan? Thank you, Jeff. Francesca will finish our lightning round. I will have a brief remark. Uh, Vince will have a brief remark. And then finally, a little bit over time, a lot over time, uh, we will call it a night. Francesca. Thanks, Gary. So first of all, I will remind, uh, I would remind students that AI at this point is not just a science and a technology, it's a socio-technical discipline. And this means that uh, it is so pervasive, it's impacting our lives more and more every minute and shaping our future. And this is should always be in the mind of the students because, uh, yes, it's important to be enthusiastic about the discoveries, the scientific advancement, and also what can bring, what the study of AI can bring to the understanding of human mind and human intelligence, but always they need to consider and be driven by social considerations of AI's possible impact on people and society. So to address those issues, be open to all the techniques, not just machine learning, not just symbolic, not just this, to be open to these, all the techniques and possibly new ones and be open to all stakeholders. So start by talking with the students next door in your in your, in your your dorm and they stu they're studying some social science maybe and discuss about the impact of AI with people that are not in your discipline so that together you can evaluate the impact of AI or what you're working on and be, be able to drive this technology towards a future where pro, uh, scientific progress is supportive of human progress and human values rather than the other way around. I hope uh, lots of graduate classes going forward in AI will watch tonight's event. I think somebody said a few minutes ago that it was mind blowing and I agree. Vince said that he wanted this year to be better than the last time. I said, forget about it because it was so good. But I think we might just have pulled that off. Um, at the end of the last debate, I said, it takes a village to raise an AI. I think that feels even more true now. If AI was a child before, now it's kind of like a rambunctious teenager, not yet completely in possession of mature judgment. So we all need to help. I think the moment is both exciting and perilous. I think a lot of people have pointed out the perils in the last hour or so. Um, I wanna thank everyone on the panel, um, everyone who gave up a lot of sleep to be here and stuck out to the bitter end. Um, I wanna thank you for sharing your wisdom and being gracious about sharing the stage with so many other people. I know it's hard to sit here for four hours and only get like 10 minutes in total. Um, and I wanna thank you and the audience I wrote out for taking three hours of your holidays, but really it was almost four. So thank you all in the audience uh, for saying so long. And most of all, I wanna thank Vince for launching this series in 2019 with me and Yashua Bengio and co-hosting it graciously and intrepidly with me ever since. Thank you so much, Vince. And you get the last words. Thank you, Gary. Estimate participants, ladies and gentlemen, we have just concluded a highly impactful 
AGI debate. My most sincere thanks to our speakers and a very special thanks to our moderator and co-organizer, Gary Marcus. As the AI debate come to a close, it is clear that the future of artificial general intelligence holds both great promise and great uncertainty. The potential for AGI to transform our world and unlock new levels of human potential is matched only by the need for careful consideration of ethical and moral implications of such powerful technology. As we move forward, let us remember the lesson from the past and strive to, and strive to create intelligent systems that are not only powerful and capable, but also ethical, robust, and trustworthy. Only then can we hope to unlock the full potential of artificial general intelligence and pave the way for a brighter and more prosperous future. This marks the conclusion of the historical AGI debate. Thank you all for joining us. The conversation will continue on social media with the hashtag AGI debate. Thank you. Night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. So we'll end the live stream and we will stay together in Zoom if at your convenience. I will rejoin in a minute. Thank you, everybody. I'll take a very brief break. We'll be right Thank back. you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye, everyone. Merry right. Christmas. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Have some coffee. Bye. And bye. Good morning. Bye -bye. Everyone.